economic crisis is also a time of ideological crisis. It's a time when people start to reevaluate their ideas about the world, questioning some of the most basic assumptions they once had. Every capitalist crisis in history has brought about a rethinking and regrouping of mainstream economic thought. Interestingly, this rethinking has always happened within the context of some sort of radical challenge to the economic order. Marginal utility theory, which still serves the basis of modern mainstream economic theory, emerged from the Great Depression of the late 1800s as an answer to the challenge of Karl Marx's thorough critique of capitalism. Keynesianism emerged from the Great Depression of the 1930s as a response to the failures of liberal economics, the challenge of a successful Bolshevik revolution, and strong worker movements in the Western world. Neoliberalism emerged from the crisis of the 70s, both as a backlash against the failures of Keynesianism to manage crisis, and as an assault against the growth of large popular left movements like the anti-war, student, civil rights, and women's movements, and the power of entrenched labor. Remember that what an ideology is, is a conceptual framework with the way people deal with reality. Everyone has one. You have to, to exist, you need an ideology. The question is whether it is accurate or not. And what I'm saying to you is, yes, I found a flaw. I don't know how significant or permanent it is, but I've been very distressed by that fact. With such admissions of failure from the neoliberal establishment, we can't help but begin to question the dominant economic ideas of our time. Yet, it is not clear that we are entering this ideological crisis in the context of any viable challenges to the economic order. The failures of centrally planned Soviet-style economies have largely purged the idea of alternatives to capitalism from the popular consciousness. At such a time, it may be useful to re-examine the ideas of Karl Marx to see what exactly he was trying to say in his critique of capitalism. Not because we have some desire to repeat the political experiments of Lenin, Mao, Stalin, or any of the others who claim to embody the ideas of Marx, but because Marx presents a systematic and thorough critique of capital that is wholly different, wholly unique in the history of economic thought. Such radical ideas are crucial in our search for new understanding of our present condition and possibilities for social transformation. A society without the ability to critique itself is a dangerous society to live in, especially as it enters a long period of crisis. There is a crucial difference between all the great bourgeois economists and Marx. They all saw crisis as something that came from outside of capitalism, disturbing the natural equilibrium of the market. Confronted with the reality that capitalism is prone to inequality, exploitation, and crisis, that is, when it becomes apparent that there is a discontinuity between their theories and reality, bourgeois economists always blame reality for not conforming to their models. Reality has been poisoned by invading external forces, they say, in the form of state intervention, labor movements, human greed. We see this same reactionary approach today in rising right-wing populism, which blames the invasive influence of foreigners, left intellectuals, homosexuals, non-Christians, and black presidents for the problems of society. Marx takes the opposite approach. He sees the social antagonisms of capitalism as internal to the system. These social antagonisms are so basic to the system that they drag all other parts of society into the gravitational field. Bourgeois economists have always seen the market as a realm of great freedom and equality. The fact that there is so much inequality, crisis, and unfulfilled freedom in market societies as seen as an imperfection in reality, not their theory. Contrary to what some people think, Marx does not start with an analysis of these social bads and then proceed to a critique of market relations. Marx doesn't begin by talking about monopoly, poverty, exploitation, or state violence. He begins with this same realm of market freedom that his bourgeois critics are so enamored with, and then shows how all of these social antagonisms spring out of this basic productive relation. For Marx, it all starts with the fact that capitalist production is production for market exchange. 
This basic form of production takes on law-like properties that he calls the law of value. What did Marx find so interesting about capitalist societies? It wasn't just the freedom to buy or sell anything you wanted. It was the fact that in order to participate in the social life of a market society, one has to buy and sell things. In order to survive, in order to participate in society, one has to enter the market to buy things and to sell the products of their own labor. This is a distinctly different organization of society than previous societies, where working people largely supported themselves with their own labor. That is, they labored to make things for their own use. In a capitalist society, people don't make things that have any use for themselves at all. They produce things in order to exchange them. Thus, the coordination of the social labor process happens indirectly through exchange. In a society of private producers, coordinated indirectly through the market, the social relations between these people take the form of relations between things, of commodity relations. The relations between people become value relations expressed in commodity prices. Economically, people can only relate to each other through money prices, through value. This world of commodity relations takes an independent form outside of the control of individuals that acts back upon and directs the flow of human affairs. Adam Smith called it the hidden hand of the market. Marx calls it the law of value. What is the law of value? It is the impersonal blind forces of the economy exerting their influence upon society. It is unique to a society in which the dominant form of labor is production for market exchange. The relations between people become value relations between commodities, and these value relations become impersonal forces which have unexpected consequences for society. For instance, we get capital. People have always used tools and other resources in their labor. These are called means of production. In a capitalist economy, means of production become capital. Tools, machines, materials, and even workers are all commodities with values. This makes it possible to buy means of production in the market and to sell the products of those means of production for a profit. That is, a person can invest money in production merely for the sake of getting more money. The pursuit of value as an end in itself becomes the dominating force in society. This is what capital is the expansion of value for its own sake, regardless of the social cost. Capital takes the form of a class that owns the means of production, and another that must produce the profit for capital. Capital is inherently asymmetrical, great poles of wealth and poverty spreading out from it in geographical and economic space. Capital is also self-negating, Although it represents an impersonal force above society dominating the worker, it also relies on the worker to create profit for it. There is a social antagonism at its root. This social antagonism leads to periodic crisis and constant instability. All of these radical implications, and many more, are part of Marx's theory of value. This video series will cover various topics in Marx's theory of value. The difference between use value, exchange value, and value. The relation of supply, demand, and price to value. Abstract labor, exploitation, crisis, socially necessary labor time. And even what an understanding of value can tell us about changing the world. It is hoped that they can contribute to a better appreciation of the importance of value theory to radical movements today as they seek ideas with which to articulate their demands and strategies. Many people, supporters, and opponents of Marx, think that they already know all there is to know about Marx's theory of value. Let's take a brief quiz, to find out how much you know.
Here are 10 true or false questions. Take out a paper and pencil, and keep track of your answers. I'll give the answers at the end. 1. Marx's theory of value holds that any human labor creates value. <laughs> 2. For Marx, value and price are the same thing. 3. Marx's theory of value is the same as his predecessor David Ricardo. 4. Marx didn't believe the forces of supply and demand were relevant to explaining value. 5. Marx's theory of value is a theory of what workers should get paid. <laughs>10. Marx hated babies. The answer to all of these questions is false. If you answered true to any of them then perhaps you do not know enough about Marx's theory of value to actually make an informed judgment about it. If you are interested in understanding one of the most thorough theoretical critiques of capitalism ever created then perhaps this video series might be a good starting point. If you already know that you are going to hate Marx's analysis then perhaps watching this video series would be a good starting point in educating yourself so that you do not sound like a total idiot when you go mouthing off all over the internet. The internet has given us access to more information than any generation before us. It has allowed for a great leveling of access to information, allowing everyone to contribute to the sharing of information. But this hasn't necessarily made our culture better informed, more intelligent, or better at critical thinking. In our rush for instant information, we are losing our ability to properly contextualize information, to synthesize ideas, and to discern what sources of information we can trust. Let's face it. In our consumer culture, we are conditioned to want instant gratification for no effort. We want easy answers that don't require any personal sacrifice. You can't learn everything you need to know about capitalism from a YouTube video. On the internet, any fool can and will explain their inarticulate and half-formed personal theories into a webcam. Barack Obama is a socialist. The guy is a freaking socialist. Liberal, Democrat, these are just different words for socialist these days. Okay? When Barack Obama these videos are not like that. They don't represent my ideas at all. I'm trying, to the best of my ability, to explain a complex body of intellectual work that spans a long history of debates as people grappled with these ideas. By acquainting ourselves with a history of ideas, we can make sure that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past and that we are aware of the implications of our arguments. But a video or a blog cannot substitute for the real thing. I'm dealing with complex, difficult ideas, and I'm not perfect. I may make mistakes. I may leave things out. If you really want to understand Marx, you must go to the source. We should also be aware of the ability of video to manipulate us on an emotional level. Images, tone of voice, and background music can all be helpful in helping us understand things, but they can also evoke emotional responses that are not necessarily rational. We should be aware of the way media affects our understanding of material and not let this get in the way of rational intellectual thinking. There is already enough of a shortage of rational thinking in our society. There are also a lot of ideas in each of these videos. One viewing may not be sufficient to absorb everything. That's why I post the full text on my blog. 
The blog sometimes also contains tangents and side arguments that were cut from the video, as well as references and suggestions for future reading. I hope that the references on my blog might be a good starting point for people who are interested in learning more. As we move through these different topics in the Law of Value, our understanding of the Law of Value will deepen. At the end of each video, there is a summary of the new layer of meaning we have added to the Law of Value. It would be wise to keep returning to this basic question as we progress through these videos. What happens when the relations between working people take the form of value relations between commodities? There are a lot of people that are really powerful in the world. Presidents, CEOs, bankers, leaders of movements. But there is an object, a thing, that is more powerful than any of them. This object is money. Money is really powerful. It makes people, societies, and countries do all sorts of things. The pursuit of money, as an end in itself, occupies many people's lives and is the driving force of economic growth. And all over society, money acts as a symbol of status, prestige, and social power. The funny thing about money is that it is just an object. Nowadays, it's not even a valuable object like gold. It's just pieces of paper or digits on a computer screen. It has all this power and influence, yet it needs no will, weapons, or words. This phenomena where objects have social power, in which things act as if they have a will of their own, is what Marx sought to unravel with this notion of the fetishism of commodities. When Marx talked about fetishism, he wasn't talking about whips and chains and leather outfits. He was talking about the way the relations between producers in a capitalist society take the form of relations between things. The word fetishism originally was used to describe the practices of religions that attributed magical powers to objects, like idols or charms. If the Israelites of the Old Testament won a battle with the Philistines, they attributed their victory to the powers of the Ark of the Covenant that they carried around. If they lost, it was because they had pissed off the Ark. Of course, in reality, it was their own actions that caused them to win or lose. Attributing their own powers to an object is fetishism. For Marx, money and commodities are much like this. We think that they have mystical powers, yet their powers really come from us, from our own creative labor. Let's take a look inside a workplace. It could be any workplace, a capitalist factory, a peasant commune, a family farm, whatever. Here, the relations between different workers are direct. I make a widget and I hand it directly to the next person. If something needs to change about the labor process, someone brings workers together and says, now we will organize things differently. Whether it is a democratic or hierarchical form of organization, it is an organization that happens directly between people. Now let's take a look outside the workplace at the market. In the market, things are different. The organization of work, the division of labor, doesn't happen through direct social relations between people. In the market, the products of labor confront each other as commodities with values. These interactions between things act back upon production. They are what send signals to producers to change their labor, to produce more, produce less, go out of business, expand business, and so on. Farmers, electricians, and auto workers don't directly relate to each other as workers. Instead, the products of their labor meet in the market and are exchanged with one another. The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't see the work that created them. 
we just see commodities standing in relation to one another as values. A TV's value is worth so many ears of corn. A car's value is worth so many jars of peanut butter. The value, the social power of the object, appears to be a property of the object itself, not a result of the relation between workers. We are atomized individuals wandering through a world of objects that we consume. When we buy a commodity, we are just having an experience between ourselves and the commodity. We are blind to the social relations behind these interactions. Even if we consciously know that there is a network of social relations being coordinated through this world of commodities, we have no way of experiencing these relations directly because they are not direct relations. We can only have an isolated intellectual knowledge of these social relations, not a direct relation. Every economic relation is mediated by an object called a commodity. This process, whereby the social relations between people take the form of relations between things, Marx calls reification. Reification helps explain why it is that in a capitalist society, things appear to take on the characteristics of people. Inanimate objects spring to life, endowed with a value that seems to come from the object itself. We say a book is worth $20, a sweater worth $25, but this value doesn't come from the sweater itself. You can't cut open the sweater and find $25 inside. This $25 is an expression of the relation between this sweater and all of the other commodities in the market, and these commodities are just the material forms of a social labor process coordinated through market exchange. It is because people organize their labor through the market that value exists. The illusion that value comes from the commodity itself, not from the social relations behind it, is a fetish. A capitalist society is full of such illusions. Money appears to have godlike qualities. Yet this is only so because it is an object which is used to express the value of all other commodities. Profit appears to spring out of exchange itself, yet Marx worked hard to explain how profit actually originates in production through the unequal relations between capital and labor in the workplace. Rent appears to grow out of the soil, yet Marx was adamant that rent actually comes from the appropriation of value created by labor. We see these fetishistic ideas in modern-day mainstream economic theory, in the idea that value comes from the subjective experience between a consumer and a commodity, and that capital creates value by itself. Yet the theory of commodity fetishism isn't just a theory of illusion. It's not that the entire world is an illusion, reality existing somewhere far below the surface, always out of sight. The illusion is real. Commodities really do have value, Money really does have social power. Individual people really are powerless, and material structures really do have social power. There is not a real world of production existing below the surface in which the relations between producers are direct. Relations between people are only indirect, only coordinated through the mystifying world of commodities. The theory of commodity fetishism is central to Marx's theory of value, and it's one of the things that sharply distinguishes him from his predecessors. Adam Smith and David Ricardo both held that prices were explained by labor time. But Marx's value theory is much more than a theory of price. It's a theory of the way the social relations between people take on material forms that then act back upon and shape these social relations. Labor takes the form of a value embodied in commodities. Money price becomes the universal expression of this value. The pursuit of money as an end in itself dominates society. Means of production become capital. Money, commodities, and capital, as representatives of social value, become independent forces in their own right, out of the control of society. The law of value is the law of these forces. Attempts to exert some control over these forces, through monopoly or the state, always become enmeshed in the social antagonisms of value. Yay!
Attention! Forward! March! Specter haunts the face of Marxist theory, the specter of the mud pie argument. It was this central conundrum that Marx devoted his momentous work, Das Mud Pie. It has since haunted Marxist theorists of all persuasions. How can Marxist theorists go on in light of this devastating theoretical problem? <laughs> if you spend any time reading about Marx's theory of value on the internet, you will probably come across some version of this asinine excuse for a critique called the mud pie argument. The basic style of the mud pie argument is similar to many advanced by those who know nothing about Marx's theory of value. One constructs a ridiculous straw man argument that has nothing to do with Marx and then proceeds to knock it down with devastating brilliance, moral outrage, and a few clever asides about Stalinism. The mud pie argument goes something like this. Marx claimed that labor is what gives all commodities value. But what if I make a mud pie? This is the product of labor, yet nobody will buy it. It has no value. So ha! Take that, Karl Marx! The problem with this argument is that Marx was very clear that labor has to be useful labor to create value. Yet he didn't think that it was this usefulness that creates value. Labor has been doing useful things for millennia. All societies are made up of useful labor. Marx calls this useful labor that makes up a society social labor. The organization of this social labor differs from society to society. In a capitalist society, this social labor is organized through commodity exchange. The products of labor are assigned market values, and the fluctuations of these values coordinate the social labor process. This is a way of organizing social labor unique to capitalism, and it has all sorts of unique properties that other forms of social labor don't have. The usefulness of labor is not what is specific to capitalism. Value is. Hence, usefulness is not what Marx is interested in talking about. Value is. In video 4, we will look at why usefulness can't explain the amount of value a commodity has. For now, we will look at this more fundamental question. What does it mean for useful labor to take the form of commodity exchanges? The key difference between humans and animals for Marx is in the way they create their own worlds. Humans aren't slaves to their own evolutionary destiny, repeating the same patterns of survival over and over for millennium. Instead, humans actively shape the world in which they live. There is a certain creative aspect to human labor, in which we imagine the product of our work in our mind before we go about the work. But what distinguishes the worst architect from the best of bees is this, that the architect raises his structure in imagination before he erects it in reality. This world which we create forms the structure of our lived experience. We live in, wear, eat, and think about the products of our own creation. The structure of our social relations from the way we relate in cultural and family groups, to the organization of production, to ideas about the world we live in, constitute a created universe powered by the creative power of human labor. Yet this world of our creation also acts back upon us. It structures both our desires and our means of attaining these desires. In much mainstream economic thinking, human desires and the means of attaining them are treated as universal, timeless things. Marx says the opposite. What we desire, and how we go about getting the things we desire, changes as the organization of our society changes. In this sense, men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. In different times and different places, this organization of human activity has been radically different. The level of technological development, the organization of production, the organization of classes, and the shared conceptions about the world have all changed radically over time. It is the organization of these different modes of production and the way the organization of production affects the other aspects of society that was of interest to Marx. In essence, Marx is asking what this organization of production 
can tell us about a society. This means that Marx is not just interested in any labor; he is interested in social labor, labor that is part of this mode of production, labor that goes into the makeup of a society. Useless labor, like the labor of a mud pie maker, is not social labor. The first step, then, in looking at a particular historical mode of production, is to ask how the private labor of an individual becomes social labor in that society. If you were a medieval peasant working a plot of land with your family, you would be laboring directly for your own use. There would be no mystery about whether the labor you were doing had use to your social group, or whether the right amount of labor was being allocated to the right tasks. The private labor you did on your land would be directly social. In a capitalist society, we don't produce things in order to use them ourselves. We produce things in order to exchange them in the market. We don't care about the usefulness of the things we are producing. We only care about receiving money in exchange for our labor. We then use that money to enter the market and buy the things we need for our own personal use. The production of a commodity and the use of it are separated in space and time. They are separated by value. They are linked by value. In order for our private labors to become social, they must first take the form of value. This is a very different type of social labor than in pre-capitalist societies. Rather than being directly social, capitalist labor is indirectly social. People don't directly decide what to produce. Instead, these decisions are made through the fluctuations of market signals, a constant back and forth of buyers and sellers. But these market signals aren't some autonomous power. They are composed of the aggregate individual labors of millions of separated producers. This separation of production and consumption means that our labor has both an individual value and a social value. The individual value is the amount of work that actually goes into making something. The social value is the actual amount of value the commodity sells for when it enters the market. Because producers are separated from each other by the market, because we have no collective control over production, we have no way of knowing for sure how much labor time society requires of us. And what sort of labor it should be, we don't know what the demand will be for our product. We don't know how much of the product other producers are making. We have to guess these things. We only find out once the products of our labor meet the products of everyone else's labor in the market. This means that the individual value, the amount of time an individual puts into making a commodity, and the social value, the amount of time society requires go into it, can differ. If individual value and social value diverge, what does this mean? Some people think that Marx held that individual value had to equal social value. That if I spend 15 hours making a sandwich, then this has to be the value of the sandwich. But this is not at all what Marx argued. Marx wanted to show how individual values become social values in a market society. Unlike other forms of production in which we labor directly for use. In a capitalist society, we labor to produce value. Yet society must still use the products of our labor. We can't all make the same thing or all make useless things. Labor must be apportioned between the right tasks in the right proportions. Value is the mechanism that does this, since value is the only connection between individual laborers. Marx sought to explain how value acted as a force for the regulation of individual labor, turning individual labor into social labor. The fact that we discover the social value of our individual labor in the market creates the illusion that it is the market itself which is creating value. We bring the objects of our labor to the market, and there they are turned into money, making it seem like the subjective decisions between buyers and sellers are what create these money prices. This is what is being insinuated by the mud pie argument: that it is the subjective valuation of the usefulness of a commodity that determines its value, not the labor that goes into it. Yet this is an illusion, a fetish created by the fact that our labor is indirectly social.
Yet, contrary to what some vulgar economists want you to believe, individuals are not free to buy and sell commodities at any price they want. This is because exchange is not just a fleeting, isolated contract between two individuals. Each exchange is part of a vast web of exchanges, which unites the productive labors of society. This is what it means for an individual's labor to become social. When this happens, society acts back upon the individual, disciplining their labor to make sure that they are doing socially useful labor at something near average productivity. Thus, the transition from individual value to social value isn't a random one. It has law-like properties that govern the connection between the private labors of millions of individuals and the aggregate social labor process. These law-like properties that link our private labors to their social value is what Marx calls the law of value. There are two basic forces that govern the way individual values become social values. The first is average productivity. Let's say the average widget maker takes one hour to make a widget. This social average is the social value of the commodity, the amount of time society requires to make a widget. But I am old and slow. I take three hours. This is the individual value. My individual value is higher than the social value. But that doesn't mean I can sell my widget for more. I must sell at the social average. Marx calls this socially necessary labor time. In this case, the determination of social value is made not by my individual labor time, but by the average productivity of society. If the socially necessary labor time changes due to changes in productivity, then the individual value and the social value will change too. The second factor is the interaction of supply and demand. Supply is determined by the total amount of labor that goes into making widgets and the productivity of that labor. But when we go to the widget factory, we do not know how much labor as a whole society is devoting to making widgets. There could be a million other people making widgets or only a few. We only learn how much labor society has put into widget making when we enter the market and compare the products of our labor with the rest of society. If too much labor goes into widget making, then there is an oversupply of widgets. Their social value falls below their individual value. If not enough work has gone into widgets, there is an undersupply, and their social value rises above their individual value. These deviations trigger changes in the allocation of labor. But what about demand? Isn't demand a random subjective element in the equation? As we will see later on in the video on supply and demand, demand traces its power back to the labor process as well. Demand isn't just an abstract psychological substance. It's a definite amount of purchasing power made of workers' wages and capitalists' profits. Even the things demanded, be they inputs for the production process or subsistence goods for maintaining the worker, are needs generated by the structure of production. People's demand for things change as the value of those things change. When the average productivity of widgets rises, their value falls, and the demand for them rises because now they are cheaper. So rather than demand existing in some subjective vacuum, it is always dependent on a pre-existing world of values. But most important to the mud pie theory, demand doesn't create the social value of a commodity. It only helps determine if labor has been apportioned to the right tasks. Labor is creating the value. Labor is doing the work. Demand tells us if this labor has been socially useful. But the demand can't create commodities, nor can it be separated from the web of social labor. You might notice that when you go to the grocery store, there isn't a mud pie aisle filled with unsold mud pies. Though capitalist production involves this element of guessing, this uncertainty of transforming private labor into social labor, this doesn't mean that capitalist production is totally random and absurdist. If exchange was random and sporadic, then there would be no way for the division of labor to be coordinated. But exchange is not random and sporadic. It is constant. Every act of exchange links the buyer and seller in a complex network of buying and selling that connects all buyers and sellers everywhere. This constant interaction of production and exchange means that most of the time, we have a pretty good idea of what social labor is. We don't go around making mud pies or bicycles with square wheels 
or hip hop polka records. Sellers are constantly saying, this is how much labor went into this commodity and so this is what we think it's worth. Buyers are constantly saying, less labor should go here, more labor should go there. The constant interaction of buyers and sellers apportions labor to the right tasks. This is only made possible by the fact that there is a correspondence between the labor that goes into something and its price. But this correspondence is loose, constantly fluctuating. The mud pie theorists display their ignorance by arguing that these deviations between individual and social value are a flaw in the theory of value. In actuality, these fluctuations are a crucial part of the theory. They are the mechanism by which social labor is apportioned. Underlying these fluctuations of demand and supply lies a more basic observation about a society organized through the law of value. We only have so much time as a society to devote to the production of our needs. If we are to have food, houses, clothes, DVDs, and beer, we are going to have to devote work to these things. Some things take a lot more labor to produce than others. They cost society more in terms of its expenditure of the total social labor. In a market society, this cost isn't decided by a committee. It's decided by prices in the market. The relation between workers takes the form of relations between commodities in the market. This is what value is, the relation between producers expressed through market prices. This is one of many abandoned houses in my neighborhood. The slumlord owner let the property deteriorate until it became unlivable and doesn't want to pay the money to make it livable again. There are thousands of abandoned houses in this city and thousands of homeless people. Despite the urgent social need for houses, these properties don't fulfill a social use. Why not? Because the owners of these commodities are not interested in their use. They are interested in their exchange value, the rent they receive from the property. For decades, they collected rent while the use value of the house deteriorated, and now these houses sit vacant, a testimony to the contradiction between use value and exchange value. This is not a contradiction restricted to housing. Every commodity contains this contradiction because every commodity is produced to be exchanged, not to be used by the producer. We have enough food on the planet to feed everyone, yet millions starve. Why? Because we don't produce food directly for social need. We make food in order to sell it for money. Society has much of the technological ideas it needs to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, yet it isn't acting fast enough to apply these ideas. Why? Because production is not undertaken to directly mediate our relation with the environment. We produce for profit. The exchange of the products of labor in the market is just one of many possible ways that the private labors of billions of individuals can be coordinated. Some people think this is the best possible way to coordinate human productive activity. Marx saw that, despite all the dynamism and technological wizardry of capitalism, there were fundamental social antagonisms at the heart of this means of coordination. That production for market exchange leads to all sorts of unexpected consequences, including gross inequality, exploitation, and crisis. And for Marx, all of these social antagonisms can't be understood until we understand the contradiction within the idea of a commodity itself, the contradiction between use value and exchange value. A commodity has a use. This is its use value. What does use value tell us? It tells us how a commodity satisfies a social need. If we want to feed everybody, we need a certain quantity of food. If we want to build everyone a house, we need a certain quantity of wood and nails. Some use values require no effort to attain. Air, sun, gravity. Others require effort to attain. 
there's a finite limit to the amount of labor that can be devoted to the production of use values. Society must apportion this labor between the production of different use values in some way. As technology changes, the amount of labor required to produce some use values decreases, thus signaling a change in the apportioning of labor. As technology evolves to reshape what human labor is capable of producing, so do our needs and desires evolve. In different societies, this labor is apportioned by different methods. In a market society, it is the buying and selling of the products of labor in the marketplace that serves the purpose of allocating labor between the production of this use value or that use value. This creates a second type of value, unique to market societies, exchange value. Exchange value is the ratio in which one good exchanges for another. Perhaps one book is exchanged for a loaf of bread, or a new car exchanges for a thousand bottles of whiskey. These ratios are all exchange values. They say a book is worth this much bread, a car is worth this much whiskey. In a developed market society, one commodity eventually emerges as the primary commodity in which all other commodities express their exchange value. That is what money is. For most of the history of capitalism, this commodity has been gold. By comparing the ratio of tomatoes or cars or baseballs to gold, all commodities measure their exchange value and ratios to gold. These two sides of the commodity, its use value and exchange value, form two opposing contradictory poles. Much of the social antagonisms of capitalism are rooted in this tension between use value and exchange value. Of course, most of the time when we look at a commodity, it doesn't seem very antagonistic. This is because the antagonistic social relations behind the commodity are not visible. But when we look at a society organized around commodity exchange, we can see lots of social antagonisms. To understand how these social antagonisms spring from the opposition of use value and exchange value, we will need to take a closer look at both. If I am selling a tomato, this tomato has no use value at all for me. Its use value only exists for the person that buys it. I am only interested in the exchange value, how much money I can get for it. Production in a capitalist society is not production for use, but for exchange. This means that we have no inherent interest in the usefulness of our labor outside of its ability to create exchange value. Now from a social perspective, it's very important what kind of labor we do. Do we make bombs or flowers, oil or cupcakes? But as individuals, we have no stake in this. We produce in order to make money, to get exchange value. Why do people produce for exchange and not for their own use? Because in a capitalist society, the working class does not own the means of producing their own subsistence. The only way for working people to get the necessities of life is to buy them in the market. And the only way to do this is to sell our labor to a capitalist for a wage. We spend our whole life making a profit for an employer so that we can spend this wage in the market to obtain our daily bread. Our job is not a means toward personal satisfaction. Our job is a means of making money so that we can buy our satisfaction in the market. Newport tastes fresher, tastes better too. Newport tastes fresher, tastes better too. Newport Bourgeois subjective value theory talks about a double inequality of exchange. It says that the only reason exchange happens is that two people value the other person's product more than the product they are giving up. Marx actually goes even further than this. He says that to the seller, the commodity has no use value at all. Not only does this bourgeois theory of double inequality of exchange give the mistaken impression that people produce for their own wants and then sell off the surplus in the market, it also imposes the profit-maximizing logic of the capitalist onto the consumer. By claiming that consumers make a subjective profit from exchange, it transposes the real, objective profit of a capitalist who pays his workers one sum of money and sells the products of their labor for a greater sum of money onto a completely intangible and unquantifiable notion of subjective profit. But subjective preferences for commodities can't be measured, divided, added to, or compared in any numerical fashion. By imposing the logic of capital onto consumers, 
it effectively erases class from the scope of its analysis. One book equals one car. What does that mean? What does it mean to say something is worth so much of something else? Some people think that the usefulness of a commodity can answer this. But uses of things can't be compared. You read books. You drive cars. They are totally unrelated and incomparable uses. Maybe you like books more than cars. Does this mean that books are worth more than cars? What does it mean to say a book is worth so many jars of peanut butter or so many cups of coffee? Clearly jars of peanut butter or cups of coffee are measuring something. And clearly any other commodity could be used to measure this something. A book could be worth so many pencils, so many kittens, so many tires. And each of these exchange values would be a different way of measuring the value of the book. But this means that the book has a value independent of the particular commodity that we choose to measure it with. Whether we measure the book's value in beers, beans, or kittens, it stays the same. Yet we can't see this value. We only see the specific exchange ratio of the book as it is exchanged with other commodities. But isn't this what exchange value really is? The comparison of the value of one commodity with the value of another? These exchange values only make sense, only work, because there is something called value that is being measured by them. Exchange value necessarily implies the presence of an underlying value. Marx uses the term intrinsic value. By this, he doesn't mean that value lies buried within the commodity, or that it is magically bestowed upon the commodity, but that it is impossible to compare commodities to each other in the market without a commodity having its own value. But what is this value? We have seen that exchange value implies that commodities have an intrinsic value expressed in different exchange ratios. This value is not use value or exchange value, but a third thing. What is this value? Where does it come from? Marx argues that it is the labor time that society devotes to the production of these commodities that accounts for this underlying value. Commodities that take more labor to create have more value than ones that take less labor. As labor becomes more productive, as it becomes easier to produce things, their value falls. But what is Marx's justification for choosing labor as this third thing? There are lots of properties common to all commodities besides the fact that they are products of labor. Marx could just as easily have said scarcity or utility were this third thing. This, of course, is the approach taken by marginal utility theory, which argues that it is our subjective desires for commodities in relation to their scarcity that determines their value. Why is it that Marx doesn't take this route? For one, scarcity and utility cannot be understood without reference to labor. The amount of a commodity that exists at any point in time is clearly related to the amount of labor that has been devoted to producing that commodity. And utility isn't just some abstract individual substance detached from the labor process. Subjective desire only counts economically when it is turned into real action, when we buy things in the market. The only way to enter the market as a purchaser is also to enter it as a seller. We must sell the products of our labor and then use this money to buy the commodities we desire. The only means of attaining our desires is the buying and selling of the products of labor. Not only does capitalism shape our desires, it determines how we go about attaining our desires. But there is an even more important reason why Marx doesn't choose scarcity and utility as the determinants of this underlying value. Utility and scarcity both describe the relation between individuals and objects. Marx is interested in the relations between people. If we think back to Marx's argument about commodity fetishism, we'll remember that in a capitalist society, the relations between people take the form of relations between things. Objects appear to have power and value on their own. But this world of appearances is not the full story. These value relations between commodities are actually relations between people, 
whose work is coordinated indirectly through commodity exchange. And this is where any social theory must begin, with a study of the productive activity of people as they work to create the world they live in. Not only is this the best starting place for an analysis of society, it is also the best starting place for a radical social theory whose aim is to investigate the possibility of changing the world. If we realize that human society is not the result of some natural or divine eternal logic, but merely the creation of our own labor, then that means that we have the power to mold and shape the society as we see fit. In a capitalist society, these creative powers take the form of an external world of value and capital that acts back upon society, shaping it against the will of its creators. Yet, in the end, the world of capital is nothing but the product of our own creation. If we truly want to change the world, it is not up to nature, God, fate, or experts, but up to us. This is the radical challenge of the law of value. Let's review and clarify a few points. 1. The usefulness of a commodity is its use value. Uses can't be quantitatively compared. 2. The exchange value of a commodity is the proportion at which it exchanges with other commodities. 3. Price is a specific type of exchange value, the ratio at which a commodity exchanges with money. 4. The fact that commodities measure their worth against each other implies that they have an intrinsic value. 5. This intrinsic value is not a physical thing, nor is it magically bestowed upon commodities. It is not a timeless trait existing for all products of labor everywhere. Value, in the way Marx uses the term, is the means by which the labors of isolated producers are coordinated through commodity exchange. It is the social substance that binds together the labors of isolated, disparate individuals separated through the market. We notice then that value and price are not the same thing. The value of a sandwich may be one hour of labor, yet we don't see this one hour when we buy a sandwich. All we see is price. Prices are just the exchange value of commodities measured in money. The only way we see value is indirectly through these quantitative relations between commodities. Though value and price are indirectly linked, their connection is still strong. If demand rises suddenly, causing the price of sandwiches to rise, this will trigger an inflow of sandwich-making labor to meet demand. And once supply and demand have balanced, price falls back down to meet value. If the productivity of sandwich-making rises, the time it takes to make a sandwich falls, the supply rises, and the price falls. Prices and values constantly fluctuate around each other, constantly co-determining each other. The last thing we should note is that this concept of value is historically specific. Unlike bourgeois economic theory, which projects its categories of utility and capital back in time to make all of history retroactively bend to the laws of capitalism, Marx's theory of value describes a specific type of social organization unique to a society in which the dominant form of production is production for market exchange. When we don't produce directly for use, but for exchange, we find that our productive activity is regulated by unconscious economic laws, which Marx calls the law of value. Whereas before we said there was an antagonism between use value and exchange value, we can now say that this is really an antagonism between use value and value. As long as production is production to produce values instead of uses, we will have to deal with the social antagonisms that spring from this contradiction. The logic of profit will dominate over society rather than the logic of usefulness. And the nature of work will be to maximize profit at all cost rather than to maximize the quality of the experience of work or the life of the worker. Thank you.
Marx is always talking about contradictions in the law of value, but these aren't logical contradictions like round square or military intelligence. They are contradictions inscribed into the very heart of the social relations of a capitalist society. Some prefer to use the word antagonisms. We are all painfully aware that modern society is full of social antagonisms. There's poverty amidst great wealth, overwork alongside massive unemployment, banks taking away homes, gentrification, racial tensions, violence against women, labor struggles, environmental apartheid, police brutality, gang violence, hate groups, massive dislocations of populations, and lots of war. Marx was interested in explaining all of these antagonisms, but he doesn't start his analysis with any of them. Instead, he begins with what at first seems a rather innocuous thing, the commodity. Why? Because the commodity is the most elemental piece of the social relations of capitalism. Let's take a closer look at that pan. The iron ore for that pan came from the Mesabi Range. Nature put the iron ore there, but it wasn't worth anything until men came along. Men with tools. The productive relations between people take the form of commodity exchanges. The commodity is the basic organizer of social relations. So, if we want to understand how all of these different social antagonisms relate to one another, we need to start with the commodity. As we've already seen, the commodity contains a contradiction. It has a use value and an exchange value. At first glance, this does not seem all that antagonistic. Yet, as we start to look closer, we see more significant antagonisms emerge. Why is it that people must sell their labor in the market for exchange value, for money? Because they can't produce their own means of subsistence for themselves. This is a distinct aspect of capitalism. In previously existing modes of production, the majority of people had use of some sort of means of production for themselves, which they used to make most of the things they needed. People sometimes bartered for or sold things, but they did so by selling part of the surplus they had created for themselves. Selling off your surplus product is very different than producing exclusively for exchange. Over the course of a very long, violent historical process called primitive accumulation, these means of production were privatized and became the possession of a group of people called capitalists. Whereas before, people labored directly for their own use. Now they have to enter the market in order to attain their subsistence. So already, the fact that we produce for exchange and not directly for use expresses a social antagonism between the propertyed and the property-less. There is an underlying coercion already at work in the free market, and this coercion requires some threat of violence to enforce it, whether it be a state, private military, or hired thugs. Violence was necessary to privatize the means of production, and it remains necessary to enforce all of the legal aspects of property. In order for people to buy their subsistence in the market, they have to sell something else. Since the means of production are privately owned, the only thing they have to sell is their labor. But of course, their labor can't really be sold. Instead, we sell our ability to labor, our labor power. We sell a definite amount of working time, whether it is measured in hours, weeks, or years. And this is why value is an expression of labor time. Our own creative working ability, the very thing that makes us human and links us to society, becomes a commodity that we sell to someone else, a commodity called labor power. Labor power, like any other commodity, has a use value and an exchange value. And, you guessed it, there is a contradiction between them. The exchange value is the money paid for our working time, the wage. Wages are set by the cost of our subsistence. They depend on the cost of food, housing, clothes, and transportation. But the use value of our labor power is that it can produce value. These are the two opposing sides of labor power. On one hand, it costs a wage. On the other hand, it produces value. This makes it possible to produce more value than we are paid for. You could be paid $5 an hour, yet produce $20 worth of commodity value an hour. If this happened, you would be exploited. In fact, your rate of exploitation would be 300%.
Exploitation is made possible by the contradiction between the use value and exchange value of labor power. Exploitation explains a puzzle about capitalism, the existence of profit. Capitalists start off the day with a sum of money which they invest in production. At the end of the day, they have a quantity of commodities which they sell for more money than their initial investment. It would seem that they have made a profit just by buying and selling things. Yet, profit can't be made through mere buying and selling. This is because buying and selling is a zero-sum game. When we exchange commodities, we are just moving commodities from one place to another. This process does nothing to change the total amount of value in society. Sure, it might be possible to rip someone off, to overcharge someone, to charge a monopoly price. But a win for one person in the market is a loss for another. There could be no aggregate profit just by moving commodities around. Yet profit is something that does exist in the aggregate. The total amount of value in society grows each year through this expansion of value called profit. So we seem to have a puzzle or a contradiction on our hands. On one hand, the market is a realm of equality and symmetry. Market exchange conserves the value of commodities, losses balancing out wins, to create an inherent symmetry. Yet profit is a phenomena where value expands. Profit is asymmetrical. More comes from less. How is this possible? To solve this puzzle, Marx tells us we must look beyond the market into the mysterious realm of production. It is in production where value is expanded through the exploitation of labor. Exploitation does not break any of the rules of market exchange because it doesn't happen in exchange. Labor power is bought at its value. The products of that labor are sold at their value. No profit has been made through these exchanges. The profit is not from the market at all, but from the labor process. It is the amount of labor performed over and above the value of the wages that determines the amount of profit. While the market remains a realm of equality and symmetry, production is a realm of asymmetry and exploitation. Thus, there is a contradiction between production and exchange. And this contradiction is made possible by the contradiction between the use value and exchange value of labor power. This antagonism between the use value and exchange value of labor power expresses a social antagonism between capitalists and workers. Capitalists and workers have opposing interests. Workers want their means of subsistence, housing, food, clothes, beer. They want use values. Capitalists aren't interested in use values. They are after exchange value. They want to expand the size of their capital by making a profit. In order for either class to get what they want, they need the other. The workers must sell themselves for a wage in order to survive. The capitalist must hire workers in order to exploit them for profits. Yet despite this codependence, their interests are entirely antagonistic. The more the workers are paid in wages, the less profit the capitalist makes. The more profit the capitalist makes, the more impoverished the working class. Clearly, the struggle between capital and labor has always been present in capitalist societies, whether it takes the form of day-to-day -day struggles over the amount of work we consent to, or long-term battles for better wages and working conditions. But even outside of the workplace, the class antagonisms of capitalism are clearly ever-present. The distribution of the value created by the working class into wages, profits, rent, interest, and taxes has everything to do with the standard of living we are able to enjoy the kinds of neighborhoods we live in, the type of life chances we have, and the quality of our lives. In a society structured to maximize profit for one class, rather than produce use values for social need, the quality of our lives is inversely proportional to the needs of capital. In the past 30 years, 
as a neoliberalism broke down barriers to the free flow of capital, massive sums of wealth have been consolidated into the hands of a smaller and smaller class of uber-capitalists, while the standard of living for the rest of the world has steadily worsened. Society has enough food, housing, and technology that the entire world's population could work a lot less and still have all of the basic amenities of life. And these lives would probably be more fulfilling if we didn't spend our whole life working for someone else. But we don't have such a society, because our labor is not aimed at creating use values for society, but at creating profit for capital. The constant revolutions in technology and productivity are not aimed at making work easier or improving the quality of our lives, but in creating more profit by submitting labor to greater control. Thus the workplace becomes increasingly dominated by machines, assembly lines, and computers, all designed to discipline labor to its task of creating more value. As the knowledge of work is removed from the worker, it is placed into the machine. The worker loses control over the labor process, becoming just a minor cog in the machine, easily replaceable. Another contradiction is revealed, that between the conception and execution of work. Our own knowledge of the labor process is taken away from us and placed in a machine which dominates us, reducing our work to a job, the carrying out of routine tasks with no meaning to us except that they are means to a wage. This is a contradiction which fascinates popular culture, man versus machine. But behind the machine lies a social relation between ourselves and our own creative powers that have been taken away from us, alienated from us, standing over us, dominating our work. And with this steady accumulation of capital in the form of machines comes another contradiction, this one between the capital invested in dead labor like machines and raw materials, and the capital invested in living labor. Though an increase in machinery allows capitalists to better exploit workers, machines can't create value. As more and more capital is reinvested into machines and raw materials, and less and less on labor, the actual value-creating substance of society is crowded out. This is the starting point for Marx's theory of crisis, as the mass of capital that must be constantly reinvested in expanding production grows, it becomes increasingly invested in dead labor rather than living labor. This sets the stage for massive crisis that require the destruction and devaluation of capital in all of its forms. All of Marx's model of a capitalist society is derived from his basic starting point, the analysis of the commodity. From this basic idea of value as the organizing principle of a commodity producing society, he establishes the contradiction between the use value and exchange value of a commodity. And then, over the course of multiple volumes, he shows how the unfolding of this contradiction reveals all of these other contradictions. Contradictions between classes, between society and itself, between people and machines, and between the conception and execution of work. What begins as a seemingly innocuous distinction between use and exchange value becomes the substance of class struggle and crisis. This doesn't mean that every problem in society is directly explained by the law of value. Yet, how can we discuss inequality without first understanding the way in which social wealth and power is created and distributed? How can we discuss violence without first understanding the coercive nature of the market, the deep inequalities generated by commodity exchange, and the compulsion of capital to accumulate at all costs? How can we discuss a solution to the environmental crisis without first discussing the way the productive relations of a capitalist society are organized. The problem with the left is not that there are not enough people who care about these things, it's that not enough people have the theoretical tools or the desire to talk about these things in terms of the basic structure of our society. That's why the law of value is so important to understand today. If we want to overcome the antagonisms of society, we need to first understand how these antagonisms are related and to do this, we must start at the beginning with an analysis of the commodity.
Alone on his tropical island, Robinson Crusoe can take as long as he wants to build a cabin for himself. It's up to him. We don't have that luxury when we produce for market exchange. When Wonder Bread makes bread, they're competing in the market against Pepperidge Farm, Arnold, and White Rose. If their workers are less productive, if they take longer to make bread, that doesn't mean that they can sell their bread for more money. The social value of bread is not set by individuals, but by the average amount of time it takes to produce bread. This is called the socially necessary labor time. In neoclassical economic theory, there are all sorts of concepts that, though mathematically elegant on paper, have very little descriptive power in the real world. When was a capitalist society ever in general equilibrium? When was there ever Pareto optimality? When did consumers ever measure their desires in utils? All the scientific devices of chronology are machines manufacturing time. The tool that in our hands means victory. And our hands must be as relentless as the hands of our clocks. They cannot afford to be less. Socially necessary labor time is not like that. Socially necessary labor time is something very real that we can observe at work every day. The private labor that goes on behind factory doors will not know for sure what its social value is until the products of that labor enter the market to be compared to the products of other workers. In the market, these private labors become social. Socially necessary labor time is asserted. This socially necessary labor time then acts back upon production. It disciplines what goes on in the factory. Factories that were spending more labor than was socially necessary are considered inefficient. They must change their production methods or else go out of business. Factories that were producing under the socially necessary labor time that were more efficient than average are rewarded. Let's say the average television takes one hour to make. One hour is the socially necessary labor time for televisions. But the owner of the Acme TV factory invests in some fancy new machines that make his workers twice as productive. They can now make a television in 30 minutes. They are producing way below the socially necessary labor time. This allows Acme to produce twice as many televisions in the same amount of time. Now, if Acme sold their new TV at half the old price, they wouldn't make any more money than before, and there would have been no point in investing in all of that new stuff. Rather than selling them at their individual value of 30 minutes, they continue to sell them at their socially necessary labor time of one hour, or perhaps just under the socially necessary labor time, in order to outsell their rivals. Because the price of TVs hasn't changed significantly, there is still the same demand from consumers for TVs. But now there is a giant surplus of TVs on the market because Acme has been making twice as many TVs. Acme's rivals won't be able to sell all of their TVs. Part of their product will go unsold. Meanwhile, Acme will sell most of their TVs at the socially necessary labor time, making not just their normal profit, but an additional super profit, because they've sold their TVs above their individual values by selling at or near the socially necessary labor time. Profit comes from exploiting workers. The only way to turn money into more money is to invest it in workers, or to be precise, in labor power, the only commodity which can produce more value than it costs. And this is all covered in the video Law of Value 5. When Acme sells TVs at under the socially necessary labor time, they don't just reap their normal profits from exploiting workers, they also get super profits, profit appropriated in exchange because their TVs are made at under the socially necessary labor time. It is this race for super profits that drives much of the technological dynamism of a capitalist society as capitalists compete to constantly lower socially necessary labor time. By doing so, capitalists don't just exploit value from workers, they also appropriate value in exchange. A 
A superficial look at the Acme TV factory might give one the impression that Acme is making more profit because they are creating more value. But this is not the case. The same amount of workers are doing the same amount of work as before. The same amount of labor time is being performed, spread out over a greater number of commodities. Thus, the amount of value they create is not increasing merely because the physical output is increasing. It is extremely important to understand this difference between physical productivity and value productivity. As it becomes easier to make TVs, their prices fall. Thus, just because we can make more of something doesn't mean we have created more value. If other firms were to adopt technology similar to Acme's, we would see the socially necessary labor time of TVs fall to half of its former value, and Acme's super profits would disappear. What does it mean to say that Acme makes a super profit by appropriating value in exchange? If you trade one commodity for another of greater value, then you have appropriated value in exchange. There are lots of ways this might happen. One of these ways of appropriating value is to produce a product at less than the socially necessary labor time, but sell it at the socially necessary labor time. Thus, we get back more in exchange than we put into exchange. But where does this appropriated value come from? At first glance, it appears to come from the consumers that buy the commodities. But these consumers are buying a commodity at its value, at the socially necessary labor time. They are not losing value in exchange. They buy a TV for $60 and they get a TV worth $60. The people that do lose value are all of those other capitalists who are still producing at the socially necessary labor time. They are not able to sell all of their product. They lose out. Acme is able to lure more customers away from them. Exchange is a zero-sum game. Whenever one person wins, another must lose. There are only so many people willing to buy TVs at the socially necessary labor time. When Acme appropriates value in exchange, this doesn't mean that they are stealing money from the coffers of their competitors. It means that they are filching away sales from their rivals. More value comes to Acme than it actually created. Less goes to its rivals. This process goes on every day in a capitalist society. We have an obsession with time and efficiency. Everything from the working day to the motions of workers are timed and rationalized. From the moment the alarm clock rings, you are checking train schedules, punching time cards, and working as efficiently as possible. We even treat our downtime as a period in which to maximize recreation and relaxation. There's an entire field of industrial engineering which is devoted to decreasing socially necessary labor time in society. And some of the most influential minds of the last century have been people like Henry Ford and Frederick Taylor who made substantial contributions to the reduction of socially necessary labor time, all in the quest for a super profit. This drive to produce a super profit does not mean that less and less labor is happening in society. It means that the same amount of labor is producing more output. We are often told that machines will make life easier, reducing the need for work. But this has never been the case in a capitalist society. Machines just create more output per hour worked. Oftentimes machines are used to get more work out of workers because the machine can dictate the pace and intensity of work. Socially necessary labor time is a force that presses down upon us, disciplining our motions, driving us to produce value merely for the sake of producing value, rewarding us when we can produce above the average productivity, and punishing us when we fall behind. Capitalists compete to lower the socially necessary labor time by investing in fancier equipment. 
The better the machines, the more efficient the labor process, the higher the output, the lower the prices, the more super profit, the more money available to invest in new machines, the more efficient the labor process, the higher the output, the lower the prices, the more super profit, the more money available to invest in new machines, the more efficient the labor process, the higher the output, the lower the prices, the more super profit, the more money available to invest in new machines, the more efficient the labor process, the higher the output, the lower the prices, the more super profit, the more money available. The tools we use to critique capitalism determine how we envision an alternative to capitalism. Models for market socialism, the talk of worker-owned cooperatives coordinated by market exchange, clearly see that production for the enrichment of the capitalist class must be done away with if we are to overcome capitalism. Yet, any society coordinated by market exchange is still disciplined by socially necessary labor time. This means that workers in such a society would still have to discipline their actions to the social average. Cooperatives that worked at under the socially necessary labor time would appropriate value in exchange. And co-ops would compete to modernize their equipment so as to lower the socially necessary labor time. And how would co-ops obtain the money to invest in better labor-saving equipment? They would have to exploit themselves. That is, the more money that workers want to plow back into making their labor competitive, the less they can pay themselves. Not only would the workers be disciplined by socially necessary labor time, they would also find themselves disciplined by the need to amass surplus value so as to stay competitive. What happens to the workers and firms driven out of business by the centralization of industries? Where do they get capital to start new firms? Do they have to sell their labor in the market? Production of surplus value for its own sake, fierce competition over super profits, the disciplining of the labor process to the whims of impersonal market forces. Sound familiar? Now perhaps one might be of the opinion that it is impossible to do away with socially necessary labor time with market coordination. If this is the case, then our best option is to debate what type of market socialism would be least exploitative, least alienating. But why not challenge ourselves to imagine a world without these things? A world without what? This seems to be the big question whenever we critique capitalism. Surely labor will always take time, and we must always have a way of coordinating labor to produce all the goods society needs. And surely, this labor must not just produce immediate goods, but also surplus goods, as well as invest in long-term projects like infrastructure and machines that will make work better in the future. So we can't say that we want to produce a society without work, without time, without surplus product, or without machines. What is unique about capitalism is that labor time, surplus, and commodities are all measured in value. The types of commodities created, the types of assets the surplus is invested in, and the quality of the life of those who do the labor are not important. What is important is this endless expansion of value for its own sake. This is capital's defining substance. But if we are to coordinate human labor, the production of surpluses, innovation, and distribution without value production, then what other method are we to use? It is not within the scope of this series to evaluate different proposals for alternatives to capitalism. But it is the place to talk about how Marx's analysis of socially necessary labor time might help us in evaluating these different proposals. We've probably all heard Marx's famous description of the higher phase of communism, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Marx didn't actually come up with this phrase, but he quotes it in one of his rare commentaries on communism. Here, an hour of one person's work is equal to an hour of anyone else's, creating a basis for real equality throughout society, regardless of the productive abilities or privileges of individuals. In the critique of the Gotha program, Marx describes the lower phase of communism as a system in which, after an hour of labor, all workers receive a certificate, entitling them to a certain amount of consumption goods in proportion to their working time, not their level of productivity. There is no socially necessary labor time and no inequality, because everyone's work has the same social power. Obviously, this is not a robust plan for how a communist society should be run but it gives us a glimpse into the sort of radical questions we should be asking ourselves when thinking about communism. 
Our private labor doesn't immediately become social. It must become value in order to be social. But in becoming value, it is disciplined by a socially necessary labor time. Socially necessary labor time acts as an external force which disciplines our private labor, constantly compelling us to work more efficiently, yet never actually making our work easier or more fulfilling. Socially necessary labor time creates the possibility for super profits when one produces under the socially necessary labor time. And the search for super profits drives much of the mad, chaotic development of the productive forces of a capitalist society, generating all sorts of unforeseen consequences. In a society not producing for competition or capital, but for communal ownership, there would not be a socially necessary labor time in this same sense. This means that work would not exist in order to make value. Work would exist in order to both provide use values for society and to better the life of the worker. In our culture, we have an intense fascination with those rare people whose work is fulfilling and challenging. Great musicians, athletes, artists, they inspire us because these are people whose work has challenged them to become the best possible person they can be. Perhaps in a world without socially necessary labor time, such an experience of work could become more universal. We get into trouble any time we try to understand something in isolation. The true meaning of things exists not buried inside them, but in their relation to other things. Take money, for instance. The meaning of this rectangular piece of paper covered in strange hieroglyphics can only be understood when we look at the role money plays in the complex coordination of modern capitalist production. Take away capitalist production, and this rectangular piece of paper loses its meaning. If we take away this context of social relations, it is impossible to understand what money really is. If we view money in isolation, we end up treating all of its social power as if it is a natural property of rectangular pieces of paper. This meaning and power appear not to be specific to a given time and place, but universal qualities that exist in all places and all times. Of course, this would be ridiculous, yet the failure to see things and concepts relationally is par for the course when dealing with bourgeois ideology. This video examines the relation between exchange and production. It argues that exchange and production only derive their meaning from their relation to each other, and that we have to understand the specific nature of this relationship if we are to really understand the full meaning of common concepts like freedom, equality, utility, scarcity, and value. Attempts to understand these concepts without looking at the picture relationally end up being one-sided. Meaning appears as internal to the object or concept itself, and not something coming from a relation. Because there is no way to account for the specific context in which a meaning appears, the meaning seems to be a natural, eternal truth. We will examine the relation of production to exchange through three different interrelated windows. Each one will give us a different perspective on the same problem. The first will be freedom and equality, the second scarcity and utility, and the third value. Where do the notions of individual freedom and equality so deeply ingrained in our modern consciousness come from? They come from the realm of exchange. Here in the world of buying and selling, all individuals are free to buy and sell their labor and the products of this labor as they choose. Nobody forces anyone to buy or sell anything to anyone else. The path of an individual's life appears as a series of free choices, 
and with this comes the notion of personal responsibility. People appear only to have themselves to blame for their personal state of affairs. This freedom to buy and sell presupposes the legal relations of individuals to own property. Thus, individuals have legal rights, the same rights for everybody, establishing a basis of legal equality for all. This generates a notion of freedom and equality in general. We talk of the inalienable rights of the individual, of human rights, of individual freedom. These are seen as universal properties of humans, and market exchange is seen as the natural expression of these properties. Already, we have clues that there may be something one-sided about our analysis. It appears that the individual has been assigned universal traits, traits that are not due to a specific set of social relations it falls within, but due to its basic nature. The individual is being understood in isolation, one-sidedly. Rather than a social structure generating a particular type of individual, a universal type of individual is seen as generating a specific social system. Whenever we see the particular masquerading as the universal, whenever we see claims as to the universality of a concept, we have clues that our analysis is one-sided. Such clues demand that we interrogate our notion of market freedom. What kind of society is required to have a world where buyers and sellers are free to sell labor and commodities as equals? We need more than just money, markets, and bourgeois states. We need a particular type of production relation. Though individuals are free to choose whom they buy from and sell to, they are not free to not buy and sell. This is because we can only access our subsistence through the market. Such a situation does not occur naturally. It presupposes a specific type of relation between producers. In order for individuals to have to enter the market to buy their subsistence, they can't be able to create their subsistence on their own. They must be deprived of means of production. Means of production must be a private commodity owned by the few, compelling the majority to enter the market to sell their labor and buy their subsistence. In contrast to the perspective of the market, where all actors meet as legal equals, in production, we see the division of people into classes, workers and capitalists. The world of market equality presupposes a world of inequality in production. This implies a specific type of production, production for exchange. In production for exchange, products are not created for the use of the laborer, they are produced to fetch a price in the market. And because the means of production are owned by the capitalist class, the goal of production becomes not meeting the needs of humans, but generating profit for the sake of profit at the expense of the laborer. The more work that can be squeezed from the worker, the greater the profit of the capitalist. Yet, when worker and capitalist meet in the market to buy and sell commodities and labor power, they meet as free consenting legal equals. There's a contradictory relationship between the freedom of the market and the despotic plan of the factory, between the equality of the market and the asymmetry of class. Yet, though the two sides contradict each other, they also depend on one another. We can't have market freedom without class and the inequalities of capital. If we just said that bourgeois freedoms are an illusion draped over a real world of coercion and inequality, we would be venturing too far into a one-sided analysis of production. We can never forget that capitalist production is production for exchange, inherently linked to the freedom of the market. Market freedoms are real, but they contradict their own material base. This contradiction between freedom and coercion, between equality and inequality, is what allows us to have a critique of our society in the first place. It is only because we are promised a freedom that we cannot have, because we see ourselves as equals in a world of inequality, that we can form an internal critique of the society we are in. It is the movement of this contradiction that allows us to posit a possible exit from such a society, inspiring us to imagine a world where freedom and equality could stand on a non-contradictory basis. 
where individuals truly could be free to choose the path of their lives. If you were to open a standard economics textbook today, you would read that economics is the study of how the autonomous decisions of utility-maximizing individuals allocate the use of scarce resources. The optimal allocation of resources is reached naturally when individuals are free to make autonomous decisions in the market. But this doesn't mean that we can have everything we want. We live in conditions of scarcity. We always want more than is possible for us to have. Therefore, we always have to make trade-offs. So our textbook reminds us that the fact that we may want more from the current state of affairs, that we aren't happy with the world, is just a part of life. We will always want more than we can have. Thus, economics defines its aim and focus quite narrowly. It is focused on the decisions that individuals make in the market. Its focus is on exchange. That doesn't mean it doesn't say anything about production. But its observations about production are based on the basic principles it learns from its analysis of exchange. Production is also just a realm of individuals making choices between scarce resources, nothing more, nothing less. And with this framework, neoclassical economics is able to justify all of the central ideological claims of capitalism. That people can only be understood as individuals and not classes that we can only blame ourselves for our lot in life, that free markets are the best route to maximizing everyone's utility, and that the current state of affairs is not only the best one, but also the natural expression of universal human nature. Here, too, we have clues that our analysis may be one-sided. As in our previous example, there is a conflation of the universal and the particular, Particular aspects of the individual's market behavior under capitalism are held to be universal, innate properties of all human behavior for all time. The particular types of choices we make in the market are considered universal choices. Scarcity is seen not as a product of a certain organization of production, but as a universal, timeless condition. These are our clues. Let us interrogate these notions of utility and scarcity to see how we might situate them within their actual social context. Who is this calculating, egoistic, utility-maximizing individual? A closer inspection shows that her existence as an individual is dependent on her existence as a social creature. It is only through a certain type of society that we have a particular concept of the individual. For one, we do not form our desires in a vacuum. We are taught what to desire. We are also taught how to pursue the objects of our desires. In different societies, people carry out these intentions quite differently. In a capitalist society, we purchase our desires. But this requires that we sell our labor in the market. And thus, our utility calculating isn't just an abstract measure of how much we want things. There is a social context that structures these calculations. We have to consider our incomes and the social values of commodities. Neither one of these things, wages or prices, can be explained solely by the world of exchange. They both require an analysis of production. The logic of production does not follow the same logic of utility maximization. Capitalists don't invest in production in order to maximize utility. They invest in order to make profit, in order to gain value in the abstract. The pursuit of money for its own sake is not a pursuit of utility. It is a separate logic a blind, calculating logic that pursues its own interest, transforming the capitalist into a mere personification of this logic. The profit maximization of capitalists forms the bulk of the economic activity in our society. Yet, it is easy to fall under the illusion that the economy is just made up of individuals maximizing their utilities. This is because the social links between all individuals, be they capitalists or workers, 
always take the form of market transactions. Our social relations are mediated through value relations between commodities. But this appearance is one-sided. The presence of the utility-maximizing individual presupposes the social organization of a capitalist society with its private property, wage labor markets, and the capitalist state. In our textbook, the individual walks by shelves of commodities to compare and evaluate. We don't need to know where they came from or how they got to the shelf. Supply is given, a static, pre-existing quantity of stuff on shelves. Economics assumes it into existence, as it does the isolated, hedonistic consumer. Upon interrogating our textbook and asking for a theory of what creates supply, we are given a familiar answer. There is a given amount of scarce resources. We must make choices between them. We are shown a static, pre-existing world of resources to choose from, as if shopping in the market. Cleverly, our focus has been diverted from any activity that actually brings commodities into being. But how can we actually understand scarcity without understanding the production process? How do we compare the scarcity of coal to the scarcity of wood? without an understanding of the fact that wood merely requires the cutting of a tree, while coal requires an elaborate mining process. The concept of scarcity is only an inversion of the concept of production. It is the work of people that produces things in given quantities. Our choices between scarce resources are actually choices between different distributions of labor. We have seen that our economics textbook is lacking None of its central claims make any sense unless they are contextualized in a mode of production, a social organization of working activity that produces a certain type of individual and a certain way of pursuing our interests. Our textbook has done a clever thing. It has abstracted away all social contexts from individuals and the objects they confront. It has made society the result of the individual, not the other way around. It has assigned social powers to objects, the particular organization of capitalist production becomes universal human nature confronting a pre-existing world of valuable objects. Marx was interested in interrogating the notion of exchange value to get to the heart of what it was really all about. It led him to a concept of intrinsic value given to commodities by labor. We've already followed this argument in video 4. Here, I will review the argument in order to demonstrate how it functions as an interrogation into the one-sidedness of the concept of exchange value. Exchange value is an observable phenomena in our world. Commodities exchange in certain ratios. A commodity's exchange value is the ratio at which it exchanges with another commodity. At first glance, exchange value can seem random and accidental. But we observe that in reality, exchanges are not accidental and random. Stocks of commodities are replenished, creating a regularity to exchange ratios. What could this process be that takes away the accidental nature of exchange and replaces it with a social regularity? When I say one book equals 30 pencils, I am comparing magnitudes. But magnitudes of what? To compare magnitudes, you have to have some substance or essence that you are comparing. This leads Marx to conclude that commodities have an intrinsic value. All of these different exchange values are just different ways of expressing this intrinsic value. But we never see the intrinsic value. We only see the various commodities that are used to measure its magnitude. We are still in the world of exchange. All we have done is to analyze the nature of exchange value, which leads to this idea of intrinsic value. But here is where we have to leave the world of exchange in order to ground our concept further. Intrinsic value is a pivot concept that forces us to move to the world of production. What is the substance that intrinsic value is made up of? It can't be the use value of commodities because use values can't be quantitatively related. You can't compare the use of an apple to the use of a car quantitatively. 
The only logical place to look is the labor process, the process whereby individuals create the world in which they live. This answer to the question of intrinsic value was not accepted by all of Marx's critics. Some argued that there are many other things that can make up this intrinsic value, like scarcity or utility. Yet, as we have already seen, scarcity and utility are incomplete, one-sided concepts that can't be understood unless they are grounded in a theory of production. Only through an understanding of the activity of people as they shape their world and the way in which the particular mode of that production shapes the individual can we understand scarcity and utility. This makes labor the obvious focal point for our investigation into the value relations that make up a capitalist society. Labor is the way we create the objective world we encounter and the way we create ourselves. It makes sense that this notion of value might not be intuitive for some to accept. In a capitalist society, we are separated from our labor. Our working power is a commodity that we sell to a capitalist. The capitalist owns our labor and the product of that labor. We don't have a sense of our labor as a purposeful activity or a social activity. Our labor must take the form of a commodity with a market value before it becomes social labor. Value obscures the social nature of our labor. As you may know, Marx's bourgeois predecessors, Adam Smith and David Ricardo, amongst others, subscribe to a labor theory of value. You might think, then, that this means that they too had a proper dialectical understanding of the relation between production and exchange. But this is not the case. Marx reproaches both Smith and Ricardo for reducing form to content. The distinction turns out to be crucial. The content of value is labor. By this we mean that the social substance that makes up value is labor. But we don't see this content when we examine a commodity. No matter how we may poke, prod, smell it, or take it apart, we can't see its social content. That's because this content takes a material form. This form is exchange value. When we say it takes a material form, we mean this literally. The value of the book takes on the form of pencils, or tires, or baritones. So Marx makes a distinction between the content of value, labor, and the form of value, which is exchange value. This means that value and exchange value are different. And since price is just a special form of exchange value, price and value are different. Prices are just the surface appearance of value. But this value has no fixed physical form independent of its material expression in pencils, tires, or money. We only see the form of value, not the content. For Smith and Ricardo, price is immediately identifiable with value. This is what Marx means when he says they reduced form to content. They treated the content of value, labor, as if it immediately had an exchange value. They failed to understand that value is a process whereby labor takes on the material form of exchange value. But these exchange ratios are not value. They are merely the expression of this third thing, called intrinsic value. This allows Marx to examine the ways in which prices fluctuate around values, which allows him to solve some theoretical problems that eluded his predecessors. It also leads him to ask an important question that Smith and Ricardo had never asked. What type of labor produces value? Because Smith and Ricardo saw labor and price as identical, they assumed all labor, in all times, created value. As we know, these sort of appeals to universality and eternal concepts are problematic. It is only a specific type of labor that produces value, labor for exchange. And thus, only a specific type of society, in which there is a regular, predictable, disciplining of labor to the needs of market exchange, can be a society ruled by the law of value. In case it's not obvious, there's a central ideological issue at stake in this distinction between the general and the particular. It's quite simple. Things that are universal can't be changed. There's no use organizing, studying, reading, or complaining about them. If human beings are always a certain way, then that's just how it is. But if we want to change the world, we need to know what aspects of our reality are not universal. What things are merely the product of the organization of our social relations? 
What things might change under a different type of organization? In a capitalist society, much of the world of appearances comes from our experience in the market, in the realm of exchange. But from this one-sided perspective, we aren't able to see the historic specificity of these market experiences. Without a perspective of the type of productive relations that underlie the freedom, equality, and individuality of the market, we end up making universalizing and inadequate generalizations about human nature. Such a one-sided perspective makes it seem as if we are trapped in the present, as if the problems of today are universal problems of all time, unable to be transcended. One of the more common objections raised to Marx's theory of value is the objection posed by subjective value theory. Though these modern objections can take quite a crude, simplistic tone, they are echoes of a rather old debate, one that dates back to debates between Marxist and Austrian economists that took place in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Austrian thinkers like Bohm-Bawerk and Mises were staunch defenders of free markets and private property, seeing capitalism as the ultimate expression of human freedom. In response to the revolutionary challenge of Marx's economic ideas, they advanced an alternative view of economics in which economic value was not determined by human labor, but by the subjective evaluations of individuals. The Austrians called their theory subjective value theory, also known as marginal utility theory, and they called Marx's theory an objective value theory. Now Marx himself never used this sort of language to describe his theory because such a simplistic dichotomy would have robbed his theory of much of its nuance and depth. Nevertheless, Marx's defenders often accepted this dichotomy, advancing a staunch defense of Marx's supposed objective value theory. But if we really want to understand Marx's theory of value, we need to dig a little deeper than this. At first, it may seem that this debate over value theory is purely an academic one, not so urgent an issue in these times of crisis and political upheaval. But value theory actually sits at the center of any theory of capitalism and is therefore extremely relevant if we are to understand this crisis of capitalism. The subjective-objective debate is more than just an academic feud about how to theorize prices. It's a debate about two rival visions of the world, one deeply apologetic of capitalism, and one radically critiquing it. Though mainstream neoclassical economics has sought to distance itself from the particularly extreme capitalist apologetics of the Austrian school, both share a common origin in the theory of marginal utility. This economic crisis has brought to light the utter bankruptcy of mainstream economics, as its ideologues stutter and stumble in the face of an economic depression that doesn't fit into their models, bringing into question its most foundational theories, like the theory of marginal utility. In this crisis, it is important to understand the failures of the dominant ideology so that we know what we are fighting and how not to replicate those mistakes in our own movements. Therefore, we will need to spend some time in this video laying out some of the fundamental failures of the subjective or marginalist approach to economics. The mantra of all ideologies is the phrase, that's just the way things are. Econ professors and right-wing pundits love to use this phrase. When factories close, they tell us, that's just the way things are. When people are poor and live in degradation, we are told that this is just the way of the market and that nobody is to blame but the poor themselves. They can make this argument because their theory of the market is based on a theory of subjective value. If economic value is subjective, as the theory of marginal utility argues, then the marketplace is just a clearinghouse for our desires. It serves as a vast, unconscious, democratic network, adjusting needs and production with scarcity to provide the best possible organization of our competing subjectivities. The outcome of this market process can't be critiqued because it is just the spontaneous result of our desires. There is nobody to blame if something goes wrong. 
responsibility is dispersed between millions of individuals. The only thing we can critique, from the Austrian perspective, is those who try to interfere with this market process, like unions, social movements, or the government. If value is entirely subjective, then we can also have no theory of exploitation. The division of the social product into wages of workers, profit of capitalists, and rent to landlords is not explained by the power of these social classes. Instead, it is seen as the result of purely technical factors, like the scarcity of inputs relative to the subjective decisions made by workers and capitalists as they enter into free contracts. Rather than a theory of classes, we have a theory of pure individuals, all seen as equals in the market. And since individuals have always had subjective values, the subjectivists can argue that capitalism is the expression of universal human characteristics, and not a particular historical form subject to change. It is certainly true that when we go to the grocery store to spend our meager wages, we get to choose between Coke and Pepsi. But if this sort of choice is the ultimate horizon of human freedom, then we really haven't achieved much as a species. While subjectivists busy themselves with complex models of consumer behavior as we choose between Coke and Pepsi, they miss the fact that these choices happen within the context of larger institutional arrangements which we have no choice over at all. It is these larger structures that Marx is interested in, private property, wage labor, commodity exchange, and the law of value. For Marx, the market is a place where blind economic laws dominate over us, where subjects are powerless, and where objects like money and commodities are imbued with social powers. We are all hyper aware of this fact today, as we watch the most powerful people and states in the world flounder helplessly in the face of this economic crisis. The law of value commands, people obey. Great confusion comes from the fact that the word value is used to mean two different things. Some people think that because you and I make personal value judgments when we go shopping, that these judgments must be the source of the value of commodities. But the personal value judgments we make in our heads are not the same as the exchange values of commodities. Commodities have exchange values, the quantitative ratios in which they exchange with other commodities. People make value judgments, judgments which are not measurable or quantitative. Just because we use the same word, value, for both phenomena, doesn't mean that they are the same thing or that there is any relation between the two at all. Such relation has to be proven. Many logical mistakes are made by people who don't distinguish between these two uses of the same word. Don't be one of those people. Now, subjective value theory argues that we can understand exchange ratios solely through a theory of the subjective psychological motives of consumers. Now, its attempt to do so is fatally flawed, shot through with unwarranted assumptions, shoddy abstractions, and circular logic. Let's take a look at some of those problems now. Welcome to Subjectivist Island. Here lives Eugene, our happy island barbarian. Every day, Eugene makes choices. He decides to spend his time building his teepee, catching fish, or practicing his backstroke. He likes the backstroke most of all, but after so many laps around the island, he gets tired of it and starts to prefer catching fish or teepee building. Intent on maximizing his utility, Eugene gets out some paper and a pencil and makes himself a preference scale so that he can figure out the exact proportions to devote to all three activities each day. He cherishes this preference scale, because it is the source of his freedom. It's just like the preference scale you carry around in your pocket every day. You carry one, don't you? Okay, now setting aside the fact that most of us don't carry around a preference scale in our pockets, there is a bigger problem. Subjectivists want you to believe that this little story about Eugene and Subjectivist Island is all that you need to know in order to understand the functioning of modern capitalist society. Funny, then, that we had to abstract away all of capitalism, all society, in fact, in order to arrive at our theory of preferences. Were we to think critically, we might begin to suspect that there is something fishy going on with this abstraction. 
That fishy something is the stink of an ideological abstraction. We discussed such ideological abstractions in the last video, Law of Value 7, but let's review a few points here. The point of a dominant ideology is to make it seem like the present order of things is a universal order, that the status quo is the natural expression of things, unchangeable. How convenient, then, for our bourgeois theorists, that our natural universal man, Eugene, happens to contain the seed of modern capitalist society in all of his preferencing and acting. It's as if every choice made by every human since the dawn of time was just an expression of some innate capitalist instinct waiting to come into being in our modern society. But it's not enough just to point out the obvious ideological basis of subjectivist theory. We must also prove that this ideological abstraction is an illegitimate one. Let's do that. It should only take a few minutes. The parable of subjectivist island leads one to think that human desires are formed privately, independent of society. But this has never been the case. Desires are taught, socially constructed, and can't be understood independent of society. How do subjectivists respond to this? They say, yes, desires may be constructed, but this is out of the scope of economics, so we don't have to consider it. In fact, this is how modern economics deals with all criticism. It ignores it and says it's the topic of another discipline. How convenient. It's like saying we don't have to consider the fact that the earth is round because that's out of the scope of flat earth theory. We can't understand desire without also understanding the ways in which we go about attaining our desires. Here's where the abstraction of subjectivist island breaks down. On the island, Eugene attains his desires by directly acting to get the things he wants. But these are not the sort of choices we make in a capitalist society. In capitalism, we have to sell our labor to someone else so that we can make a wage that we can then spend on the things we want, but only after we've given most of our wage to the landlord, the mortgage company, and the state. Subjective value theory has to prove that it can move this abstract model of choice from subjectivist island to a full-scale capitalist economy. It does this through the fantasy of barter. Let's say Eugene, while backstroking one day, discovers another island called Barter Island. Here lives Ludwig, who cracks coconuts all day. They decide to trade fish and coconuts, each one carefully measuring their utilities for fish and coconuts on their preference scales, calculating the precise exchange ratios to maximize their utilities, resulting in an exchange ratio between coconuts and fish. Now, says the subjectivist, we have shown that our abstraction was legitimate and that we can explain exchange ratios purely through the science of preference scales. If only it were that simple. The first thing we might notice is that the exchanges on Barter Island can only take place because Eugene and Ludwig have different resource endowments. If they both had access to coconut and fish, then there would be no reason to trade. In order for trade to continue in a sustained way, trade must reproduce these differences. This means that in order for a capitalist market to work, there must be the constant reproduction of a certain type of property relation in which people have to enter the market in order to get what they need to live. Specifically, people must be deprived of their own means of production, forced to enter the market to sell their labor in order to buy the things they need. This property relation must be continually reproduced through exchange so that there is always scarcity and people are always dependent on the market. Thus, we can see that something very sneaky has been done. What is it? We were trying to form a theory of barter based solely on subjective preferences, when all of a sudden, we realized we needed to assume a certain type of property relation in order to make any sense of it. Thus, abstracting away property relations and forming a theory of exchange without them is impossible and illegitimate. Even more damning is the fact that capitalist societies don't have anything to do with barter. 
People don't produce to directly exchange products for other products. We produce in order to exchange things for money. Money is an intermediary in all economic activity. So it makes no sense to say we measure our subjective utility for coconuts against fish when exchanging. We measure everything against money. When you are in the supermarket calculating your preference scales with the preference app on your iPhone, you aren't just considering your preference for fish and coconuts in the abstract as if on a desert island. You are also considering the market prices of these commodities. This market price already exists before you make your subjective value judgments. But this is problematic. Subjective valuations were supposed to explain price, but now we have to assume the prior existence of prices in order to explain subjective value judgments. It seems we are stuck in a big, messy circle. And if we are exchanging everything for money, then we must have a utility for money, right? But money has no direct utility. It's not even good for blowing your nose on. The value of money is what it will buy. And this is not set by our preferences, but instead reflects the relation of money to all other commodities, reflecting the vast interpenetration of millions of markets all over the world. There is no such thing as a personal utility for money because money's value is already established by forces beyond our control. And there are more difficulties presented to subjective value theory by the presence of money. On Barter Island, Eugene and Ludwig had direct knowledge of what they were getting from each exchange. But in our world, we don't know exactly how much everything is going to exchange for ahead of time. When we sell a product in the market, we don't know exactly what products we will be able to buy with that income. There is a high degree of uncertainty. But with so much uncertainty, how are we ever to form those nice rational preference scales where we've perfectly calculated the exact utility relations of all commodities to each other? We can't. It seems that every time we try to abstract away property relations and production relations, they end up sneaking back into the picture. This is because it is absolutely illegitimate to try to explain capitalism without a theory of social relations between people as they actively produce the world they live in. Luckily, we have a better theory, and that's the theory of Karl Marx. In the real world, outside of the fantasies of bourgeois economics, subjects and objects have no meaning apart from their relations to each other. There is no such thing as a subjective individual floating in a vacuum. We develop our subjectivity through our relation to the objective world we inhabit. And the objective world can't be understood apart from the actions of societies of individuals who transform this world, bending it to their will, giving it meaning. Subjects and objects always exist in a relation, deriving their meaning from this relation. On subjectivist island, it seems like subjects form their value judgments through passive contemplation before they act on them. Judging happens first, and then action. In the real world, we can only understand our subjective preferences once we understand the active process by which people relate to and transform the world. People work on nature. We chop trees and make houses. We build cars and dig up oil to power them. In transforming the objective world, we also transform ourselves. The modes by which we work upon the world determine our views of the world, the sort of values, needs, and desires we have in this world, and the manner in which we pursue these desires. These different modes of producing have changed throughout history, each mode producing very different sorts of societies with very different value systems. These different modes of relating to and transforming the world Marx calls modes of production. Capitalism is certainly not the first mode of production characterized by extreme inequality, war, exploitation, and instability. These qualities are part of all class societies. What is unique about capitalism is the way this domination of one class over another takes the form of relations between commodities. This is due to a particularly unique subject-object relation in capitalism, something Marx calls subject-object inversion. We will return to this in a moment.
Objections to Marx's theory of value often have to do with the way his theory of value relates to market prices. If value comes from the amount of labor that goes into producing things, then how do we explain the fact that a rise or fall in demand changes market prices? The fact that demand influence price makes it seem like subjective decisions influence value as much as labor time. The value-price relation is a complex one, and I will deal with it in greater detail in a future video, Law of Value 11. But a few remarks are in order here. We've actually covered this ground briefly before in Law of Value 3, where we talked about the way private labor becomes social labor. Private labor is the amount of labor an individual worker devotes to the production of a commodity. The goal of the worker is for her private labor to become social labor, that is, that her commodity be sold in the market and thus be equated with all other commodities in the market, making her labor part of the total social labor of society. But this isn't so easy. Because production is only coordinated through the fluctuation of market signals, it is always uncertain whether commodities will be sold and whether private labor will become social labor. As we've seen in previous videos, in order for private labor to become social, it must produce at the socially necessary labor time. Socially necessary labor time is a way in which the social level of productivity acts back upon the private labor of the individual, disciplining the individual to work at the social average. Individuals or firms that can't work at the socially necessary labor time go out of business, like when American auto workers lose their jobs due to competition with plants in other countries. Their labor is then reallocated to other areas where they can be more profitable or they don't work at all. As many of us know, losing a job and having to find new work is a long, hard, painful process, but these discomforts don't matter to the market. The market treats all labor like digits in a calculator, anonymous units to be moved around in search of profit. The gap between private labor and social labor is the mechanism by which labor is moved around and reapportioned through the blind forces of the market in the absence of a social plan. Now, all of this should sound familiar, but what does this have to do with the relation between demand changes and price? Well, the same process of reapportioning labor happens with changes in demand. Just like the need to produce at the socially necessary labor time, society must also apportion the right amount of labor to produce the right amount of things so that markets don't become oversaturated or understocked. If a supply of elevator music exceeds demand, then some of this music will remain unsold and some of this private labor will not become social producers will be forced to move their labor elsewhere. This apportioning of labor happens through the fluctuation of price. This does not mean that demand creates value. Demand hasn't created anything. It has merely indicated through price signals that labor needs to be reallocated. This is how demand affects the distribution of social labor in a society coordinated through the fluctuations of prices. This distribution is only possible because there is a relation between price and labor time. So we can show that demand, rather than creating value, is part of the reallocation of labor that is implied in the gap between private and social labor. But we can also take this analysis further and show how demand itself is produced in capitalism. From the perspective of subjectivist island, it seems like demand is the product of free independent minds viewing reality from some distant objective standpoint. But in reality, our subjectivity is a part of the mode of production. This is nowhere more apparent than in the capitalist mode of production. In capitalism, the only type of demand that counts is effective demand, that is, demand backed up by purchasing power. Consumer demand comes from wages paid to workers. That means we can't understand demand without first understanding wage labor and exploitation. The products which consumers buy with this money are not just the random result of psychological preferences. In fact, most of our money goes to the purchase of very basic things we need in order to keep us alive as workers so that we can produce more value for capitalism each day. Rent, food, clothes, 
These are needs and desires dictated to us by capitalism for the purpose of perpetuating capitalism, not the abstract psychological preferences of isolated individuals. But the bulk of demand in society comes not from consumers, but from capitalists. You and I buy toothbrushes and pay rent. Capitalists buy factories, assembly lines, natural resources, and private armies. This demand has nothing to do with the personal preferences of capitalists. It has to do with the technical requirements of production, the amount of inputs it takes to make a widget at the socially necessary labor time. Some people think that capitalists enter production only in order to meet the demands of consumers. This is a myth. The advertising industry is the best refutation of this myth. Capitalists produce in order to make a profit. Then they go looking for markets. Most of the time, they have to create the market by convincing people there is a need for their product. But capitalist firms also sell to each other, totally bypassing the need to find consumer markets. This all gives us a very different picture of the subject-object relation than we get in bourgeois economics. Rather than a free society of empowered individuals who are free to act upon their abstract desires and take full responsibility for their lot in life, Marx's critique of the capitalist mode of production reveals a world in which individuals are at the mercy of the coercive laws of the market. The sorts of superficial freedoms they have to choose between Coke and Pepsi pale in comparison to the disciplining of our lives to socially necessary labor time and the pursuit of profit. The way that corporations are people, my friend. We can raise taxes, and of course they are. There's a Everybody lot of talk in the Occupy Wall Street movement about ending corporate personhood. The problem with this demand is that the legal status of corporate personhood is just the icing on the cake. In a capitalist society, corporations are much more like people than people are. Capital is the active subject, and people its object. This is what Marx means by subject-object inversion. Rather than people being the active agents of the social order, it is the objective logic of the market that dominates subjects. Blind economic laws rule, and people obey. Money becomes more powerful than life. Corporations become people and exert more power in society than individuals or even social movements. While people run around in the street with signs begging the system to take notice of them, the cold logic of capital becomes the active agent in society, using the body of the worker like a passive expendable commodity, subordinating societies, governments, and even nature itself to the impersonal motives of profit. The crazy thing is that this objective world is still just the product of our own creation. We actively reproduce it every day. This is what makes Marx's critique of capitalism so powerful. The world we live in, despite the incredibly disempowering structure of our own situation, is always only the result of our own actions, and we do have the ability to collectively change it. But in order to exercise such collective power, we must break with the capitalist mode of production. In case you were wondering, Subjectivist Island and Barter Island don't exist. They are abstractions. Now, Every theory needs abstractions. We must sift through a world of data and identify the broad contours and important categories that define reality. Subjectivist and barter islands are ideal abstractions, that is, abstractions that exist only in the minds of philosophers. Marx makes a different kind of abstraction, a real abstraction. A real abstraction is not made by philosophers arbitrarily leaving out parts of social reality. A real abstraction is made by reality itself. In a capitalist society, human labor becomes abstract. In the caste system of feudalism, where people were born into certain types of work and there were strict divisions between castes, there was no such thing as labor in general or a worker in general. But in a capitalist society, 
Labor loses all of these specific features. Capital treats us like anonymous digits in a profit calculator, moving us from place to place in the search for profit. Our labor becomes abstract labor. We become not peasants, knights, or artisans, but workers in general. Marx's theory of value is based on this real abstraction that is made by the mode of production itself, not the minds of philosophers. This doesn't mean that the perspective of marginalism comes from nowhere. Marginalism comes from a real existing standpoint within capitalism, the standpoint of the atomized individual contemplating commodities. This standpoint is real. We experience it every day at the grocery store. But it is an incomplete perspective because it leaves out the entire world of social production that puts commodities on the shelves and money in our pockets. This perspective is the perspective of commodity fetishism, in which the social power of our own labor takes the form of inherent properties of objects. But in times of economic crisis, we see cracks in the walls of this reality. Old ways of thinking lose their relevance. Crises are a time when the economic laws of capitalism are exposed, not as eternal, universal laws as the bourgeois economists would want us to think, but as the particular laws of this time, laws that we might be able to overthrow. As the law of value breaks down, as people start to question the order of things, the capitalist state must enter the picture, replacing the failing law of value with the brutal law of the state. The charming, freedom-loving world of the market apologists is revealed for what it really is, an exploitative order based on violence. Like a schoolyard bully, a system is always the most violent when its weakness is exposed. When the law of value breaks down, the politics begin. Subjects must become active. This can be the politics of the ruling class as it scrambles to reassert the status quo, or it can be the politics of radical movements that posit the possibility for new social orders. Money can really fuck you up. It can make you lose your home. It can make you go to work. It can topple governments, cause wars, pave the jungles. Of course, it's really nothing by itself. Pieces of paper, digits in a computer. And of course, money doesn't literally take away homes, topple governments, cause wars, or fuck you up. People do these things. Money, then, seems to have a strange power to compel people to do things. It has a certain social power. What kind of social power does money have? It seems to have any social power we might want it to have. In a society in which social life is coordinated by market exchange, money has the ability to buy any aspect of this social life, to compel any action, to coordinate any complex activity. The more money we have, the greater our ability to command this social power. This is a non-specific power. It is not tied to any particular activity, commodity, or person. It is social power in the abstract. This is not social power in the form of guns or tanks. It is social power in the form of these strange tokens of value used to measure the quantitative relations between commodities. This abstract social power goes by another name, value. The subordination of society to the rule of value we call the law of value. In other times and places, social power took the form of a sword. It was direct, concrete. But value is not like this. It is abstract. We do not know where it comes from or where it's going. It does not come from the 1%. It does not come from the Fed. It comes from a specific organization of society. What sort of organization of society is necessary for the existence of this value in the abstract? 
This is not just an academic question. This question gets to the heart of how we understand capitalism and how we envision alternatives to capitalism. Oftentimes, we hear quite different recipes for ending the rule of capital. Abolishing private property, ending wage labor, capturing the state, smashing the state, democratizing money, ending money, and so on. There are many different facets, many different interpenetrating parts of the dense tapestry of interrelations that make up a capitalist society, and they all bear the mark of the dominance of value relations over our lives. How we understand the relation of the parts to the whole affects how we understand an anti-capitalist project. So, when we ask what sort of organization of society is necessary for the existence of this value in the abstract, we are setting the stage for an exploration of the inner relations of capitalist society. Bourgeois theory tends to restrict its view to the marketplace. This is why it always refers to capitalism as a free market society or a free enterprise system rather than a wage labor society or a production for the sake of production system. From this narrow viewpoint, we only see freely consenting individuals making mutually beneficial exchanges. From this viewpoint, it seems that value is nothing else than a benign byproduct of mutual agreements between market actors. The benign nature of this viewpoint influences not only mutualist anarchists, but also some socialists who want to preserve some element of market exchange in their anti-capitalist vision. But this narrow picture of exchange is not adequate to actually explain the phenomenon of value in the abstract. When two Robinson Crusoes meet in the desert to trade, their exchanges are not abstract at all. They are related to very concrete personal desires. It is quite another thing in a society organized through exchange where we can observe regular, predictable exchange ratios between commodities. In order for us to form predictable, reliable exchange ratios between things, there must be some predictable knowledge of the quantity of things we have to exchange, how much we will have tomorrow, and so on. We must have some predictable supply. The force that constantly replenishes these supplies is, of course, human labor. This brings us to a fuller picture of our society ruled by abstractions. Rather than just a society of free exchange, it is also a society in which this exchange is regulated by production. The production of commodities by people creates both the demand for and supply of these commodities. The exchange ratios between commodities, their values, are signals which coordinate the social labor process. Thus, we have a society in which exchange and production constantly regulate each other. Behind the movement of commodity values in the market lies a parallel process of the movement of labor from one task to another. The social power of money, of value, lies in its ability to move about this labor. If the abstract social power of money comes from its ability to measure and command labor, what kind of labor is this labor? Knitting? Building? Singing? It's any kind of labor. Labor in general. Abstract labor. We began by asking what sort of society makes the rule of abstractions possible, makes the law of value possible. After penetrating the surface appearance of market exchanges, we found that it is a society in which value relations between commodities are directly related to the labor that produces these commodities. And now we have seen that the abstractness of these value relations is paralleled by the abstract nature of labor. Does this answer our question as to what sort of society makes such abstractions possible? No. Marx is sometimes taken to task for his concept of abstract labor. How is it possible, some ask, for Marx to theoretically equate all of these different sorts of labors, manual and intellectual labor, skilled and unskilled labor? Labor is never abstract, they argue, but it is always a specific type of labor. Marx's reply is typical of Marx. 
We don't have to theoretically equate all of these different labors. Society does it for us. Society already treats all labor as an abstraction. For us as individuals, our work seems very concrete and very important. But when we suddenly lose our job because of an economic crisis, when we see jobs move to other countries, when we see entire skill sets replaced by machines, we realize that our own livelihood means nothing to capitalism. For capital, our work is just an abstract unit in a giant profit calculator. We are just another digit to be moved around. In this sense, though our work seems very specific and concrete to us, for capitalism, it is completely abstract. All that matters is that it produces value. If abstract labor is not a philosophical idea, but a real phenomenon, a real abstraction that is made by capitalism itself, then that leads us to ask again, what sort of society makes this possible? The answer is this. In order for our labor to become abstract units in the profit calculator of capitalism, capital must own our work. Our working time must be a commodity. A society ruled by the law of value requires wage labor. People are not commodities, but their ability to work is. This is called labor power. We said that the buying and selling of commodities regulates the division of labor, sending signals that apportion labor between different tasks. This can only happen if labor power itself is also a commodity to be bought and sold moved about. Wage labor is the mechanism by which the hidden hand of the market moves labor inputs about. We finally have an answer that seems adequate to our initial question, what sort of society makes possible the law of value, the subordination of society to the abstraction of value. We see that this abstraction of value is tied to the abstraction of labor. In this abstract labor, relies on the existence of labor power as a commodity. When labor power is a commodity, then the specific uses of that labor become irrelevant to capital. All that is important is that profit can be produced by exploiting this labor. It doesn't matter if this labor knits sweaters or makes guns. It doesn't matter if we work 80 hour weeks or work dangerous jobs. It doesn't matter when the mines collapse on us. It doesn't matter when we are replaced by robots or when our jobs move somewhere else. It doesn't matter when unemployment drives down our wages. Our work is just an input into the production of value, of social power. Capital is the expansion of this value, of this social power, for its own sake, not for any particular purpose. Value is a social power because it commands people. It buys their time and commands them to do its bidding. It does this not for the sake of the worker or the consumer. It does this not for the sake of the 99% or the 1%. It does this for the sake of producing value for its own sake. It has no human purpose, though there are some humans that benefit greatly from this process. Yet, our answer to this question still points to other questions. What sort of society is necessary in order for wage labor to be the dominant form of labor? We must have a society in which people don't have access to their own means of production, but instead must sell their labor power in the market in order to survive. This requires private property, a capitalist state to guard this property, and lots of drugs and smooth jazz to keep us passive. This is why, whenever the law of value seems to be breaking down, like in an economic crisis, the state must step in to restore the smooth functioning of value relations. Rather than a simple answer to our question, what sort of organization of society is necessary for the existence of value in the abstract, we have arrived at a complex web of social processes. We haven't found one fundamental evil to be stamped out. Instead, we see that there are many different overlapping dimensions to the question of value. Social power, value relations, class, property relations, and the state are all bound up in our analysis, each reflecting a different aspect of the law of value. 
So what parts of these interrelating factors need to be gotten rid of if we are to overthrow capital? I would argue that we need to do away with all of it. Value, money, abstract labor, wage labor, capital, private property, the state, and so on. Other folks might take less ambitious positions. Different political positions on this issue come from different ways of understanding the way the interrelations of a capitalist society fit together. For the market socialist vision, it seems that all we need to do is replace the class relationships in the workplace with a cooperative workplace, leaving market exchange intact. But such a cooperative society would still have wage labor, socially necessary labor time, value in the abstract, and abstract labor. Cooperatives would still be compelled by competition to produce surplus value in order to expand production and stay competitive. Production would still be for the sake of producing surplus value, and not for the sake of bettering society. It is probable that the most efficient and successful firms would be those with the least cooperative structure and the highest disciplining of labor. For the 20th century communism of the USSR, it was initially the seizure of state power by a vanguard of the working class, the nationalization of property, internationalism, and the administration of production by a plan that was thought to be sufficient to break with the capitalist mode of production. Yet the plans of the planners soon began to resemble the most despotic plans of the capitalist workplace. In order to compete in the world market, planners found that they needed to extract the highest amount of surplus value from workers as possible. There was still wage labor, socially necessary labor time, surplus value, and abstract labor. The same year the conveyor belt was introduced to Soviet Russia, they revised their textbooks to claim that the law of value now applied to socialism. This means that if we are to be serious about anti-capitalist politics, we have to be serious about our analysis of capitalism. What is it we are really trying to do away with? And what forms of organization can replace capitalism effectively? The word abstract can mean many different things. A painting is abstract if it doesn't have any references to representational objects. An idea is abstract if it moves out of the realm of the concrete example and deals with general principles. When Marx talks about abstract labor, as we discussed in video 9, he is using the term in a unique way. For Marx, the abstraction that is abstract labor is not one that happens in the minds of philosophers. It is one that happens in reality. It is a real abstraction. This seems an interesting enough proposition to warrant this brief supplementary video on the topic of abstraction. <laughs> What does it mean to abstract? We abstract all the time. When we say woman, we are not talking about any concrete, specific woman. We are talking about women in general. Yet there is no such thing as a woman in the abstract. We cannot meet her at a bar and buy her a drink. We can only experience concrete women, specific women. To attempt to look at the complex totality that is a capitalist society only in its concreteness, only in the specific actions of trillions of individuals all happening at the same time, would be madness. We have to separate out the patterns, finding terms that can encompass a broad swath of concrete behaviors into general abstract terms. Instead of talking about rice, tanks, and DVDs, we have to talk about commodities. Instead of talking about carpentry, dentistry, and bicycle repair, we must talk about labor. When we use the word abstract, we can mean the verb, the act of abstracting, or we can mean the noun, the concept which forms an abstraction. 
There are many abstractions which we may choose to extract out of the complex whole of capitalism and label as the most important, fundamental defining abstractions. In forming our abstractions, we have choices to make. The way we abstract and the way we piece together these abstractions determines how we understand the whole that we are trying to explain. In our analysis in video 9, we found that value is an expression of abstract labor and that abstract labor is a direct result of the organization of production through commodity exchange. We further noted that this organization is only effective when labor power itself is a commodity to be bought and sold. And labor power only becomes a commodity with a specific type of property relation and a specific type of state that can guarantee the stability of this property relation. Thus, our analysis grounded the abstractness of value and abstract labor in a concrete type of social organization. Rather than an analytical approach that seeks to find an abstract essence behind reality, we took the opposite approach. We moved from the abstract idea of value toward a concrete picture of the sort of world that makes this abstraction possible. Oftentimes in philosophy we see people trying to identify abstract properties or essences that lie behind the concreteness of everyday reality. Marx wants to do the opposite. He wants to identify the specific types of social organization that makes the abstraction of value possible. This movement from the abstract to the concrete is also a key feature of Hegel's dialectical method. Yet, there is something quite distinctive to the way Marx uses this method. The way Marx's abstractions are grounded in the real social practices of capitalism. When we talked about the abstract term woman, we noted that we cannot ever meet woman in general, but only specific women. However, we can meet value in general. In fact, we carry it around with us every day in our pocket. It is money. So the abstraction that is value is not a mental or philosophical one. It is a real one. This is why Marx begins his analysis of capitalism with an analysis of the value form. This also differentiates Marx's method from bourgeois methods of understanding capitalism. For Austrian economists like von Mises, it is the abstraction of free human action that is the foundational abstraction that frames his theory of capitalism. But we could not ever see human action in the abstract. It is merely a philosophical device, and thus appears as an arbitrary starting point for a philosophical system, begging the charge of being an ideologically motivated starting point. Because abstract labor is a real abstraction, this means that the theoretical system that we build out of it is not just a question of logically extrapolating principles and ideas in our heads from a given starting point, like we would do in bourgeois philosophy. Rather, since the abstraction is a real one, we must proceed by trying to ground this abstraction in real social practice. It becomes an anthropological investigation. This is why in video 9, the question that always propelled us forward in our analysis was, what sort of society makes this abstraction possible? We had to uncover a complex system of social practices that allowed such an abstraction to emerge. Such an approach of grounding our analysis in real social practice keeps us from falling into the trap of fetishism. We have talked about the fetishism of commodities in several videos uncovering the different aspects of the fetish along the way. In one sense, the fetish is a bad abstraction. A fetish attaches the social power of the whole to an isolated, abstracted part of the whole. For instance, when we say money is power, we are taking the social power of labor as commanded by the value form and attributing it to little pieces of paper. To treat money like it has some inherent social power is a fetish. On the other hand, the social power of money doesn't go away just because we have exposed the fetish with our fancy theories. Money really does have power because value is a real abstraction. This makes Marx's fetish argument 
quite mysterious and tricky. It is one thing to make a bad abstraction and attribute the powers of the whole to one piece of the whole. It is quite another when this abstraction is a really existing phenomena that can't be changed by theory. Depending on our vantage point, we can argue two different points. On the one hand, money and commodities are just objects and do not have any inherent social powers. They derive their value and social form from a specific organization of labor. On the other hand, the social power of money and commodities is not an illusion. In a capitalist society, they really do have value and social power. The fetish is real. This strange phenomenon of commodity fetishism leads to all sorts of confusion when we think about capitalism. It can lead people to the conclusion that money has some inherent value, that capital creates its own surplus value without labor, and that exchange value comes from the material properties of commodities. Marx does not just dismiss such ideas. Instead, he subjects them to the same sort of analysis that we have just discussed. He seeks to ground these ideas in real social practices. All of video 9 could be seen as a Marxist critique of the idea that money has some inherent value. Rather than dismissing the idea, we acknowledge the fact that money does have power. We then show that this power is not a result of the material properties of money, but a result of a specific sort of social organization of labor. Thus we can show that such an idea, the idea that money is power, is the result of a specific type of social relation. In this way, Marx destabilizes bourgeois theory. He takes bourgeois ideas and shows why they are possible. Here is a yo-yo. Let's say it took an hour to make, parts and everything. And here is a bag of high fructose jelly beans. Let's say they took 20 minutes to make. What if they both sold for $5, despite having different labor contents? Wouldn't this be a big problem for Marx's value theory? When people get their panties in a bunch about price and value, it's over this issue of price and value not being the same all the time. Is this non-identity of value and price the end of Marx and the end of all radical politics? I hope not. After all, the reason we have two concepts, value and price, is because they are not the same. It is the relation between them that counts. It is the relation between them that explains the inner mechanisms of capitalist production and exchange. If value and price were the same, we would automatically know how much labor went into a commodity and what level of output we needed to meet society's demand. But if we already knew all of these things, then there would be no need to have value or price or even a market for that matter. We could just plan everything on a computer. But we don't have a planned economy. How much yo-yos and jelly beans should society produce? How much of society's labor time should go into each? Nobody knows. And when the capitalist buys plastic and string and hires yo-yo makers, she doesn't know how much profit she'll make. And when we go to the store, we can't see how much work went into our yo-yos and jelly beans. These decisions all must happen through the fluctuation of price signals. These fluctuations reflect back upon production to discipline and apportion labor. When we say that labor is disciplined, we mean that Joe Schmo on the jelly bean assembly line is pushed to work at the average level of productivity. On the shop floor, he is pushed by the speed of the machine and his boss. But the machine and his boss are being pushed by competition in the market to lower the socially necessary labor time it takes to make jelly beans. When we say that labor is apportioned, 
we are talking about how many people work at the jelly bean factory, and how many work at the yo-yo factory, and so on. In other words, we are talking about the division of labor. The division of labor and the socially necessary labor time determine what is produced, how much is produced, and what the values between these commodities are. But the unique thing about capitalism is that these decisions about disciplining and apportioning labor only happen after the labor has been performed. Price signals are judgments on past labor, which then influence future labor. As the products of labor leave production, enter circulation, and then become inputs into future production, we have a continual feedback loop of information. This feedback loop could be confusing unless we remember this important principle. Value cannot be created in exchange. Once you understand this, almost everything else falls into place. Value is created in production by human labor. It takes the form of commodities with definite values. Commodities enter the marketplace where they acquire prices. Sometimes these prices are above their values, sometimes below. These signals act back upon production to discipline and apportion labor. Thus, the enormous complex division of labor in a capitalist society is coordinated through the value relations between the commodities. Because value cannot be created in exchange, this means that the exchange of commodities is a zero-sum game. If some commodities sell above values, then others must sell below. There can be no aggregate increase in value merely through the process of commodities changing owners. To have new value, there must be new labor. Unlike neoclassical theory, where prices arise merely from the collision of subjective motivations of individuals bartering, totally abstracting away from the production process, the Marxist theory of value and price directly links these phenomena to the need for society to reproduce itself through a capitalist division of labor. Yo-yos don't walk around with one hour of labor written all over them. We only know the social value of a yo-yo through its money price. This is what we mean when we say that price is the form of appearance of value. Price is the visible, tangible form that value takes in the world. We only see the relations between laborers through the exchange ratios of commodities. Now money is the god of all commodities. It is the one commodity that all other commodities measure their value in. Thus price is a very special type of exchange value. Prices represent value in the abstract. They are measures of abstract labor. Thus, when the price of a jelly bean rises above its value, this means that the jelly bean commands more money than its value, that it commands more abstract labor in exchange than it required in production. If value can't be created in exchange, this means that the total amount of value produced is always equal to the total prices of those commodities. But individual values and prices can and must diverge in order for the price mechanism to discipline and apportion labor. One of the main reasons that prices deviate from values is the constant fluctuations of demand and supply. As capital revolutionizes the productivity of labor, values change, output and prices change, and demand and supply fluctuate. If demand for jelly beans is higher than the supply, then the prices of jelly beans rise above their values. They command more abstract labor in exchange, and this triggers a reapportioning of labor to bring supply in line with demand. In the case of a monopoly, supply is kept artificially low so that prices rise and the monopolists get extra profit. If the supply and demand of yo-yos, jelly beans, and all other commodities magically balanced, then prices would actually equal values. But if this was the case, we wouldn't have much need for price. We'd automatically know how much labor input went into anything we demanded, and we could just organize everything on a computer without a market. Sometimes people think that profit comes from unequal exchange. This can be true for individuals, but not for society as a whole, because value cannot be created in exchange. 
one person's loss is another's gain. In order for there to be an aggregate increase in society's profit, there must be exploitation of workers for surplus value. In order to not confuse the isolated individual profits that can occur from unequal exchange with the surplus value generated from exploiting workers, Marx often suggests that we imagine that values equal prices. This simplification allows us to more easily see the origin of surplus value. This does not mean that Marx actually thinks that prices always equal value, or even that they gravitate toward that state over the long run. In fact, he says just the opposite, that demand and supply rarely meet, and that prices and values are rarely the same. Marx's argument about surplus value, and all of his other conclusions as well, are totally valid whether or not values equal price. Sometimes people think that by pointing to value-price divergences, they have somehow undermined the theory of surplus value. But this is an error, because the theory of surplus value does not require prices to always equal values. Before we move on, we should review the main points thus far. Value cannot be created in exchange, only moved around in exchange. Money is the measure of value. If a commodity sells above its value, this is the same as saying that it commands more labor in exchange than the labor that went into it. I haven't been to a yo-yo factory, but I picture an assembly line of people wrapping string around yo-yos. But this isn't all of the labor that goes into a yo-yo. Before any of this labor can commence, materials must be purchased. String, plastic, molds, paint, and all of those inputs come from past labor processes elsewhere in the world. Every labor process has new active labor, which Marx calls living labor, and inputs from past labor, which Marx calls dead labor. Dead labor cannot create value. The cost of purchasing inputs like string and plastic is passed on to the output prices of yo-yos, but no new value comes from this labor because it's already done laboring. Living labor creates the new value. The worker creates the value of their wage so that the capitalist makes back their investment. The worker also performs surplus labor for the capitalist. This is surplus value. At the beginning of the day, the capitalist lays out money for inputs and wages. This is her cost of production. If she wants to continue to make yo-yos tomorrow, she will need to make back enough money to buy inputs and wages tomorrow. Thus, prices are inherently tied to the need for the system to reproduce itself. She also needs an incentive to invest. This is profit. Thus, prices are inherently tied to the need for capital to exploit labor. The capitalist doesn't lay out anything for surplus value. This she acquires from the worker for free. That's why it's called exploitation. But the profit capitalists get from selling their commodities is not always equal to the surplus value they've produced. If the prices of commodities rise above their values, then when they are sold, the capitalist's profit is higher than the surplus value contained in the product. Surplus value has been transferred in exchange. I started by saying that price and value were not equal because they were different concepts. Now, we can add that surplus value and profit are not always equal because they represent different concepts as well. Surplus value can only be created in production, but it can be redistributed in exchange. If a capitalist's profit is higher than the surplus value they create in production, we call this super profit. As we discussed in the video on socially necessary labor time, Super profits are the prime motivating force of a capitalist economy. They drive innovation and attract investment. They are a necessary part of capitalist competition. Now, if you really want to talk about surplus value being redistributed in exchange, then you have to talk about prices of production. It starts with a puzzle. Let's say jelly beans just take a tiny bit of living labor compared to all the dead labor that goes into the inputs. You basically buy a lot of sugar, corn syrup, and dye, 
and then you hire one person to push some buttons in a factory while machines turn that sugar into beans. But let's say that yo-yos take a lot more labor in comparison. You buy a little bit of plastic and string, and then you have to hire people to make the plastic molds, paint the yo-yos, and then let's not forget how long it takes to wind up a yo-yo. So the two industries have different proportions of a living to dead labor. Since the yo-yo factory has a higher proportion of living labor, we can assume that the yo-yo factory must produce more surplus value than the jelly bean factory. More workers means more value means more surplus value. We'd expect the yo-yo factory to be more profitable. But then there's also this phenomenon called average profits. This is where the puzzle comes in. If capital is free to invest in any industry, free to move in search of the highest profits, this causes a tendency for profit rates to equalize. Jelly bean makers start to invest in the yo-yo industry, cutting into their profit margins. Capital flows from one industry to the other. Supply and demand change, prices change. Eventually, assuming the free flow of capital, jelly bean makers and yo-yo makers enjoy the same average rate of profit. Now you see the puzzle. One industry produces more surplus value than the other, but they have the same rate of profit. How can this be? If we remember that value cannot be created in exchange, and that surplus value cannot be created in exchange, then we can easily solve the puzzle. First, we note the following two principles. Total prices equal total values, and total surplus value equals total profit. And so the answer to our riddle is this. Surplus value is redistributed between capitalists in exchange to form an average rate of profit. That should seem simple enough since we've already discussed the redistribution of value in exchange. How do capitalists redistribute surplus value? Did they send it to each other in the mail? No. Prices do this work of redistribution. The prices for some commodities fall, others rise, and thus capitalists gain and lose surplus value in exchange in a way that equalizes profit rates. In this way, surplus value becomes less of the property of the individual capitalist and more the property of the capitalist class as a whole, uniting the class in their common interest in the exploitation of labor. These new prices, the prices which redistribute surplus value to form an average rate of profit, Marx calls prices of production. Prices of production systematically deviate from values, yet they are directly related to values. The total level of surplus value created determines the amount of value that can be redistributed to form these new prices of production. In addition, the tendency towards an average rate of profit is merely a tendency, just as supply and demand fluctuate, never balancing, so do profit rates. So we see several different factors to keep in mind when discussing price. If there is no equalization of profit rates and demand and supply are in balance, then we can say that value equals price. If we assume a perfect equalization of profit rates and supply and demand are in balance, then we can say that prices equal prices of production. If we then let supply and demand fluctuate around these prices of production, we get market prices. Sometimes Marx just talks about value. Sometimes he talks about prices of production. And sometimes he talks about market price. These are three different levels of abstraction. Many mistakes have been made by people not paying attention to what level of abstraction is currently being discussed. Bohm Bawerk, for instance, complained that in one place Marx said that value equals price, but in another place said that prices of production equal price. He thought Marx was contradicting himself. But had Bohm Bawerk been interested in actually reading Marx a little more closely, he might have realized that Marx's analysis takes place on many levels of abstraction, that we must keep all these levels in mind at all times if we want to understand what's really going on. We should also keep in mind that Marx's central conclusions about exploitation, crisis, and all the other antagonisms of a capitalist society still hold, whether we are talking about value, price of production, or market price. Regardless of the level of abstraction, value can't be created in exchange, 
and surplus value can only come from the exploitation of the working class. We can only conclude that Marx gives us a quite robust and practical explanation of the way that commodity exchange regulates the reproduction of a capitalist division of labor and class relations. There's definitely a lot more to say on the topic and a number of controversies to examine. On my WordPress blog, you can find footnotes and references pointing you to more information and resources on this topic. And now we can see how radically different Marx's theory of price is from his neoclassical critics. For neoclassical economics, price is a reflection of equilibrium, of a state of rest where all utilities are maximized. For Marx, price formation is a ceaseless process of fluctuation that is part of a much larger process of value formation and distribution as capitalists compete to exploit workers better than their competitors, thus constantly revolutionizing the technological basis of society. From Marx's theory of price, we can immediately move to a theory of capitalist crisis. Because the tendency toward an average profit rate redistributes value between industries, there's no way to keep firms from investing more and more in machines and less and less in workers. In fact, the race for super profit compels capitalists to decrease socially necessary labor time by spending more on machines to make workers more efficient. This means that while individual capitalists race to increase their own super profit, that over time, the average profit rate of the economy as a whole falls. The worker finds herself confronted with a greater and greater mass of machinery, while the capitalist class finds itself getting a lower and lower rate of return on larger and larger investments. The time is right for crisis.